Okay. The appointed hour is six o'clock being reached. I want to welcome everybody to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather at one place, this public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on a link on the town's webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permitting Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst, Boarding, Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. We will begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA who will be impaneled for the consideration of the comprehensive permit. I'm Steve Judge. Mr. Langsdale? Here. Ms. O'Meara? Here. <laughs> Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Everyone hear me okay? Yep, is that Mr. Maxfield? In fact, I've arrived. All right. And the associate ZBA members, Ms. Sharon Waldman? I'm here. Mr. Barrick? Here. Mr. Greeny? Here. And Mr. Meadows? Here. Also in, in attendance is Maureen Pollock, planner, Christine Brestrup, planning director, uh, Dave Zalmek, assistant town manager, and Nate Malloy, planning, uh, planner in the department of uh, planning, and John Witten of the KP law firm, who's assisting the board in this matter. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial -jud body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health convenience, safety, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. The subject of tonight's public hearing is ZBA 2020-39, a request by Valley Community Development Corporation for a comprehensive permit to construct a multifamily building containing 28 units located at 132 Northampton Road, Amherst. Tonight's agenda, this is the first of several public hearings and the public meeting that will be held in request in, on this request for a comprehensive permit. Tonight's agenda is as follows. We're going to note the submittals received by the board from the applicant, town boards, committees, as well as the applicants themselves will give a full presentation of all the, of, to the public. We'll review the June 23rd site visit. There will be an overview of the 40B comprehensive permit process, which is a little different than the process we use for special permits. We will discuss and consider the town's subsidized housing inventory and a motion to invoke a safe harbor. The assistant town manager, Dave Zymek, will give a presentation on how we got here. The applicant will give a full presentation of the request for a comprehensive permit, and the impaneled members of the ZBA will ask questions. We will also set a deadline for responses to questions that could not be answered tonight. After discussion with the applicant and questions from the board members, we will schedule subsequent public hearings and meetings to consider this application. The board will conclude its meeting by nine o'clock tonight. It is possible that there will not be enough time for public testimony tonight. There is already a public hearing scheduled for July 2nd at which the public comments will public comments will be heard and we will have other hearings at which public testimony will be taken. I want to review the ways in which the public can be informed about and comment on this application. In addition to these public meetings. Residents can be notified of any additional information recorded by the town concerning this application through the notify me feature on the 132 Northampton page of the town website. 
Also, all copies of all submissions can be found on the town website. Public comment can be submitted on the town website or through an email to Maureen Pollock, planner at P-O-L-L-O-C-K-M at amherstma.gov. This meeting will be broadcast by Amherst Media on Channel 17. And of course, there will be public, public comment tonight if time permits, and certainly at future public hearings. Tonight, the board is holding a public hearing on ZBA FY 2020-39, Valley Community Development Corporation, 132 Northampton Road, requesting a comprehensive permit under M Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40B, to construct a new two and a half story residential multifamily building containing 28 small studio apartments and related common areas on an approximate 0 0.88 acre property located at 132 Northampton Road, map 14C, parcel eight, general residence and educational zoning districts. Before we begin, are there any disclosures by any uh, members of the ZBA? If not, I want to remind the applicant, board members, and others to seek recognition from the chair if they wish to speak. You can do that by using the raise your hand feature in Zoom. When recognized, unmute yourself, and when you have finished, please place yourself back on mute. We have received the following submissions from the applicant. Comprehensive permit applications, check for applications fees, project summary, development team biographies, a butter list request form, locus maps, zoning maps, a table of community concerns and responses, and a table of zoning waiver requests. In addition, we've received a plan set of approximately 30 different plans, um, which I'm not gonna run through all of those different, um, but they're all done by Austin Design. Teague and Bond and Berkshire Design Group and Stevens and Associates and dated May 8th, 2020. We've received a stormwater, stormwater management report, a manage, management plan form and narrative, a sample lease, a sample residential tenant handbook, housing management resources book, a household member resident policy, bed bug policy, tenant charge list, parking study, a traffic study, site control, including the deed, site approval letter um, and finding of no adverse impact by the Massachusetts Historical Commission dated January 2nd, 2020. In addition, we've received from um, submittals from municipal boards and the staff, a letter from the town council president, Lynn Grismeyer, on behalf of the Amherst Town Council dated February 24th, 2020. A letter from Amherst Town Manager, Paul Bockelman dated February 24th, 2020. Letter from Christine Brestup on behalf of the Amherst Planning Board dated February 21st, 2020. Letter from Chair John Hornick on behalf of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust dated January 23rd, 2019. A letter from the Chairman Michael Burkhart on behalf of the Amherst Housing Authority Board of Commissioners dated February 27th, 2020. And another letter from the Amherst Town Council dated June 15th, 2020. In addition, town staff has submitted the following a project application report dated June 23rd, 2020, comments from the Amherst Fire Department, Department dated June 9th, 2020, comments, additional comments, comments from the Amherst Fire Department dated June 18th, 2020, letter from Christine Brestup on behalf of the Amherst Planning Board dated June 18th, 2020, comments from the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust dated June 17th, 2020, comment, Comments from the Amherst Town Council dated June 15th, 2020, and comments from the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development, Chapter 40B subsidized inventory for, Massachusetts, for Amherst, Massachusetts, dated June 2nd, 2020. As of 3 p.m. Tuesday, June 23rd, we have received 31 public comments. Um, Maureen, are there additional comments since then that we have received? Uh, yes, um, so uh, uh, the Amherst Health Director submitted comments today, June 25th, 2020, and additional uh, public comments were submitted uh, as of uh, 
uh, this afternoon. Um, I don't have the total list of submissions of those public comments. If you give me a moment. As a, those would all be available on the website. They are, they're all available yep. on the website. And those are, there's 20 uh, public comments that have been submitted between June 23rd and uh, four o'clock today, June 25th. So we have a total of 51 public comments um, that we received as of this afternoon. 20 plus 31. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, we also we conducted a site visit on June 23rd at the site. Uh, in attendance were most members of the ZBA, um, town staff, and representatives of the applicant. Uh, we visited the site. We um, saw the existing property, the existing um, building. And we um, walked the property and saw the outlines of the where the new building would propose to be sited. I'm going to because we um, need to um, relay each question that was asked at the site visit. I'm going to go through those briefly, and we will also have to ask those questions during the during the questioning period. So we asked questions about which trees would be removed. We asked questions about the grass paver. There was interest in uh, knowing um, what planting the, the plans for tree removal along the property with the abutting house and what plantings was going to be uh, put in their place. There's questions about the placement of the fence and to the bike path, uh, to the bike shed. We also saw the bike shed, uh, the placement for the bike shed. There was, a, uh, we talked about the car parking situation and walked through the, um, the layout of the parking and the site. Um, we were at, we asked about alternatives to asphalt, asphalt pavings. Um, we reviewed where the ADA rumble, compliant rumble strip would be on Route 9. Uh, we also had questions about the timing of the sidewalk um, construction on Route 9. Qu questions about demol the demolishing the existing building, the cost of the building per unit, um, landscaping potentials for shelter to, to a shelter noise from Route 9 to the new structure. Uh, we saw the location of the smoking pavilion. Uh, we looked at, we asked a question about whether the apple tree at the back of the property near the fence with the Amherst College football field would be removed. We had questions about the height of the new building and um, we measured eight of the eight foot, how, how much an eight foot fence would shield the abutting property from the new um, newly constructed property. In addition, there was questions about whether some trees would be um, would be left, and if there's any consideration given to planting between the trees um, on the border of the property and the abutting property, rather than removal and planting of new trees. Um, we asked about the cost per unit, total budget for the property, and. We looked at the locations of the proposed buildings. Those are the questions asked at the, um, that I remember that were asked at the site visit. Do any members of the board have additional questions that were asked at the site visit, which should be noted at this time? All right. The statutorily mandated process and procedures for consideration of a comprehensive permit is significantly different from the process we use for special permits and variances. Because this is the unique process, I've asked John Witten of the KP Law Firm to provide a brief overview of the comprehen comprehensive permit process required by Massachusetts General Laws 40B and Chapters 44 and 53G. John, can you please um, give us a brief overview of the comprehensive permit process? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the board and members of the, the public. So as the chair stated, uh, a application or an, an application under Chapter 40B is very different than what the board typically does as uh, a reviewing body for special permits or variances or appeals from the building commissioner. So here we're operating under a different body of law than Chapter 40A and it's Chapter 40B. Uh, the sections in Chapter 40B that are relevant are Sections 20, 21, 22, and 23. Uh, and then we are operating under a set of regulations promulgated by the Department of Housing and Community Development 
And those regulations are found at 760 CMR 56. These are all available online. The regulations and the statute work together. There is or there are some conflicts that we don't need to discuss at this point in time, <clears throat> but they do work together and the board will be working with both set of statute and regulations during the, the entirety of this process. One of the most important things, which I know the board is going to take up in just a moment, is the town of Amherst status being consistent with local needs. And the phrase consistent with local needs is a phrase found in the statute and in the regulations. And in a nutshell, it allows a municipality that has achieved certain standards, certain production standards, to protect itself from an appeal of its decision. Amherst has achieved one of those standards and the board has the right to protect itself from an appeal of your decision from or by the applicant. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. The other big difference though between Chapter 40B projects, comprehensive permits, and the garden variety special permit or variance is that the Rules governing comprehensive permits really are elastic. The board can grant waivers from local regulations. The board can grant waivers from local bylaws. The board can grant waivers from any local permitting process. The board is guided in those waivers by two really important functions. One is, but for the waiver, would the project be rendered uneconomic, another phrase found in the statute, and or, but for the waiver, would the project not be buildable? When an applicant is a nonprofit, such as the applicant before you this evening, the standard really is not uneconomic, but will the project fail? Will the conditions imposed by the board or the failure to grant waivers render the project a failure? We can talk more about that as, as the board goes through the process. The other important thing to remember is that the elasticity that the board can apply to a comprehensive permit project is guided by health and safety standards. The statute, Chapter 40B, specifically calls out health and safety of the residents of the proposed development, health and safety of the abutters to the proposed development as a general theme, and Provisions for open space is explicitly called out for in the statute. So the board is operating really under two principles. One is we don't want to make the project uneconomic or render too many conditions such that it fails if the board wants to approve it. And the board is balancing all this by the need to protect the health and safety of the occupants and the general community at large. All of that is diminished by the fact that Amherst is consistent with local needs. So a crude way of, of, of phrasing it would be the Board of Appeals could really do as it saw fit with an application under the Comprehensive Permit Statute because the board has achieved this consistency with local needs. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. The board needs to entertain this application and the board needs to review it and decide ultimately whether it should be approved with conditions or denied. But being consistent with local needs means that the applicant cannot appeal your decision. And we will get to that piece in, in just a moment. So Mr. Chairman, I, I'm happy to talk further, but, but if, if that's sufficient, let me, let me stop there. I think that's, that's good. Gives us a good overview. Massachusetts cities and towns are in a safe harbor from the statute and regulations governing comprehensive permit applications, such as the ones we are hearing this evening, they are entitled to render a decision on the application without the applicant being able to appeal an unfavorable decision by the board. These safe harbors, referred to in both the statute and regulation as being consistent with local needs, includes a city or town containing at least 10% of its year round housing stock being defined as low or moderate income housing. Amherst has well over 10% of its, its year-round housing stock qualifying as low or moderate income housing. Therefore, Amherst is consistent with local needs 
and is entitled to the benefits of this safe harbor. In order to take advantage of the safe harbor, within 15 days of the opening of the public hearing in a comprehensive permit application, the Board of Appeals must vote to assert the town's status as being in safe harbor, and therefore notify the applicant and the Department of Housing and Community Development of the Board's vote together with supporting documentation. The applicant has the right to challenge such assertion, and if it does, the Board's requirement to close this public hearing within 180 days from tonight will be told while the parties await a decision from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Given Amherst's status as consistent with local needs, it is presumed that the applicant will not challenge the Board's assertion should the, bo should the Board vote to do so. It is important to note that Amherst's status as consistent with local needs or being in a so-called safe harbor does not require that the board deny this application. Rather, being consistent with local needs means that the comprehensive permit applicant has no legal right to challenge a decision of the Board of Appeals, whether that decision is a denial or an approval with conditions. Finally, due to revisions to the regulations that govern this process, although in conflict with the statute, the board must assert the town's status now in order to obtain the benefits of being in a safe harbor. Put it other, putting it otherwise, if the board does not assert safe harbor tonight or within 14 days from tonight, the board will not be able to assert it later and any decision on this matter would be appealable to the State Housing Appeals Committee. The town of Amherst currently has 12.59% of its housing stock qualified as low or moderate income housing. As such, I think that how the, as such, it's evident that the town exceeds the 10% threshold for safe harbor. I move that the Board of Zoning Appeals declare the town of Amherst is consistent with local needs as the phrase is contained in general laws section 40B, chapter 40B, section 20, and 760 CMR 56 as the town of Amherst has over 10% of its year round housing stock deemed as qualified or moderate income housing. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? No. Hearing no further discussion, the vote is on the motion. All votes must be by roll call. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. The vote is five nothing. The motion is approved. The next order of business is um, a presentation by Assistant Town Manager Dave Zymek, who will, do, who will talk about the progress and the, the history of this applicant and the town's involvement in providing for the uh, affordable housing in Amherst. Good evening and thank you for having me. I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Yes? Yep, it's good. Great, thank you very much for uh, allowing me some time tonight. I'll try to be brief. Um, I will be happy to share my remarks um, with uh, staff and they can be um, uh, put, in, put in as part of the record. Uh, my name is Dave Zomek, I'm the Assistant Town Manager and I oversee the Department of Conservation and Development for the town. Um, that department covers a range of projects, uh, as the title indicates, from conservation, uh, village center development, and also affordable housing. Um, and I'd like to give a little background on this project from the town's perspective this evening. Um, as you know, there's a longstanding recognized need for housing for low income and homeless people in Amherst. This need has been well documented by several studies, including, including the Housing Production Plan from 2013, and the housing market study from 2015. Craig's Doors at the First Baptist Church was opened in 2011 as a seasonal shelter for homeless people. In 2019, it housed well over 100 people uh, throughout the season. In July of 2016, the town held a public forum on homelessness that was attended by over 100 people. Representatives of several service providers spoke about the region-wide need for shelter and housing for low-income people. Residents came together to address issues related to housing for low income and homeless people. The town has been successful through the years, partnering with many organizations, both public and private, 
to provide affordable housing opportunities for individuals and families. Some examples through the years, um, if I could just go through a few, Olympia Oaks, 42 units, Butternut Farm, 28 units, Ann Whalen Apartments, uh, 88 units, Chestnut Court, 48 units, North Square in the Mill District, 26 units, Residential Apartments, six units, University Drive, mixed use building, four units, Aspen Heights on Route 9, recently 11 units and they're under construction right now. My staff and I continue to work, look for ways to build or incorporate affordable housing units into current and future projects. Our master plan in Amherst contains a chapter on demographics and housing. Among the statements contained in the master plan are encourage the development of economically diverse neighborhoods, partner with local community development corporations, nonprofit organizations, and other groups to expand affordable housing. The master plan also states to improve, improve housing and services for people in areas in the area who are homeless and many other statements uh, supportive of, of developing affordable housing throughout town. This project, I just want to talk specifically about this project and, and how staff and I have looked at it. The location of the project is a good one. Um, it's on a busy connector road within walking distance of bus stops. The project is within walking distance of downtown Amherst and shopping areas along University Drive. Pedestrian and bicycle improvements are planned for this stretch of Route 9, which will make walking and biking on Northampton Road safer and easier. The project makes sense in terms of infill. It is a property that is already developed in the neighborhood and has already um, uh, been developed for many years. Specifically, the history of, of working with the town. Valley CDC has been talking to Amherst about this type of project for several years. The Valley CDC went through an extensive process of looking at other properties in town and dismissed many of them because of cost, location, or unsuitability. A few years ago, Valley discussed a possible Northampton Road location with, with the Amherst Homeless Systems Group and the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Support from Amherst for this project has been consistent and strong. Valley has already received funding from our CDBG program for site assessments and feasibility studies to identify the site. In January 2017, Valley discussed the supportive housing model with the zoning subcommittee of the planning board and discussed a change in the zoning bylaw to allow same size apartment units in an apartment building if all were affordable. In the spring of 2017, Amherst Town Meeting voted overwhelmingly to approve a zoning amendment that will, would allow apartment building to have a, um, one size units if all units were affordable. In 2019, the town included 200,000 for Valley CDC in its CDBG application for architectural fees and energy consulting for this project. And in 2019, the town council voted to approve a CPAC request for $500,000 in support of the project. So in summary, uh, this project meets many of the goals and objectives of the town for sheltering and housing people of low income and people who are homeless. The town has been talking to Valley CDC about a similar type of project since 2017. This is a good project that meets many of our goals and objectives, and we encourage the ZBA to carefully consider it. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, and I would be happy to submit my, my comments uh, for the record. Thank you. Thank you. The next order of business is the um, presentation by the applicant. So the applicant is now recognized for a presentation on the requested comprehensive permit, including the plans for the building, the perceived needs for affordable housing, and other matters that the applicant believes will aid the board in its consideration of the comprehensive permit request. I want to, to remind the representative of the applicant and any consultants to state their name and address before they begin to speak for the record. Also, please note that should you seek that they also please note that you should seek recognition from the chair before you speak. I also want to encourage my fellow board members to limit any questions during the presentation they may have to clarifying questions. If you think of a substan substantive question during the applicant's presentation, please make note of it so you can ask that after the applicant has completed its presentation. I will assure you that there will be ample opportunity to raise any questions you may have after the presentation, but I think it works best to allow the 
a flow of the presentation to go forward. So um, who is going to begin the presentation for the applicant? Um, I'm Laura Baker, uh, the real estate project manager, hi, for Valley Community Development. Um, and I will begin it and I will be the one trying to manage our PowerPoint presentation, um, although we will have several speakers during the course of the presentation. Um, is this okay, a good time Laura, to introduce what, the theme? It's a good, yeah, it's a good time to introduce the theme. Okay. You and everybody should name and give us your name and address for the record. Business address or home address? Business address is fine in this case. Okay, uh, I'm from Valley Community Development Corporation. We're located at 256 Pleasant Street, Suite A in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I'll turn to Rachel. Rachel Leffler with Berkshire Design Group at Four Allen Place in Northampton. And I'm a resident of Amherst. Tom, you're muted. Chalmers, you're muted. Right, got it. Thank you. Uh, Tom Chalmers at Austin Design, uh, located at 2 Mead Street in Greenfield. And Felicity, who we have by phone. Felicity, you're okay. muted. Ms. Hardy, I, I, you're muted. Felicity, you should be able to speak now. I'm, I'm joining by phone because for some reason my computer audio is not working. Can you hear me now? Yes. Please. Yes. I am Felicity Hardy. I am with the Felicity Hardy Home Practice in Springfield, Massachusetts. Can't hear her. Valley, Valley uh, Ms. Hardy, is there any way you can um, speak louder or turn up the volume on your phone? Hold on one second. Let's try this. Is that any better? Not much. I'll try to project. How about that? No. Um, that working? Well, it's it's very faint, but um, do your best uh, and okay. project as I'm much sorry. as possible. I, don't, I, I honestly don't know why this is not working, um, but for some reason the computer is not working for me tonight. So I will introduce Felicity, uh, Felicity Hardy from Felicity Hardy Law Practice. Uh, her law practice is based in Springfield. So I am going to share screen now and see if we can get our presentation to come up. Any luck? Are we seeing a? Yep. Yeah. See it. Awesome. Um, we're here with you, uh, the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, June 25th, uh, presenting the Amherst Studio Apartments project, uh, which is uh, single person studios with supportive services. Uh, we will note, as uh, the chair has, that the full zoning permit application and the full plan set are available for re review on the town's website. Uh, Web page is given there below. Uh, I'm going to move pretty quickly because I feel like I'm, I'm following what uh, Dave already presented, um, which is namely that the town has identified uh, the needs that led to the development of this project in a number of town documents, including the town's uh, community development strategy, which uh, its first priority is to create affordable and fair housing options for the chronically homeless and extremely low income, low in and moderate income families, individuals, seniors, etc. Uh, the Housing Trust strategic plan cites that smaller affordable units for individuals, including persons now accommodated in the shelter, is one of their high priorities. Uh, the town's housing production plan uh, names production of housing for at-risk and special needs populations, as well as people at risk of homelessness or ha who have special needs that require supportive services. Uh, again, I'm going to move pretty fast. This presentation I can make available to people. Um, it takes us through some of the history that, that Dave mentioned. Um, Valley actually partnered with the town beginning in 2008 on trying to respond to the need for housing homeless individuals. Um, so the town issued an RFP to study creating enhanced single room occupancy units with social services to house homeless individuals. 
Valley responded and was selected. Uh, we completed a feasibility study in 2009 and made an offer on a property. Uh, the property owner refused the offer that we made. Uh, Dave mentioned the town forum on homelessness, which had a loud, large crowd in 2016. Uh, in 2016, also, the town planning department organized and conducted a tour for several affordable housing developers, including Valley, uh, and public funders to try to spur interest in the creation of supportive housing for homeless individuals in Amherst. Uh, 2017, the initial uh, planning grant, CDBG planning grant, was awarded to Valley for just over $50,000 to conduct site search and site feasibility analysis to create six, between 16 and 40 units of supportive housing, including units for homeless individuals. Uh, town groups have held a series, actually, of forums on affordable housing that highlight the topic of housing needed for homeless individuals. Uh, zoning subcommittee and planning board have held hearings, as Dave mentioned, to change the zoning to allow for one type of size of unit in an affordable housing uh, development. Uh, in 2018, uh, we, Valley, me, looked at perhaps two dozen potential sites uh, using the CDBG planning funds and ended up selecting 132 Northampton Road, which was then acquired in January of 2019. Uh, also in 2018, the CDBG Advisory Committee held a public hearing, uh, including information about our site search and this location. 2019, the CDBG Advisory Committee following public hearings recommended uh, another $200,000 grant for planning and pre-development for this particular site at 132 Northampton Road. Uh, in 2019, as we heard, the, the CPA recommended uh, $500,000 for pro project implementation. Uh, the town hosted an open town meeting with over 80 attendees to discuss the development, and there were many letters and newspaper articles written about the project uh, around that time. And following this kind of flow of, of public input, the town council approved uh, the CPA recommendation for $500,000 and the town council provided letters of support, which you've seen uh, as attachments. Um, we have met uh, specifically on this project with quite a few town boards, including the planning board, uh, advised CDBG advisory committee, CPA committee, disabilities access advisory committee, the Housing Trust, Finance Committee, and the Town Council. We have met with uh, quite a few other non-municipal groups uh, and members, including Property Butters and Neighbors, uh, the Amherst Affordable Housing Coalition, the Interfaith Housing Corporation, Amherst College Administration and Campus Police, uh, Amherst Housing Authority Board of Directors, the local Amherst Homeless Systems Group, uh, Amherst Community Connections, and the Craig Stores Board of Directors. Uh, in putting in this particular application, we've consulted with the Planning and Zoning Department, the Tree Warden, uh, the Public Works Superintendent, the Building Inspector, the Fire Department, the Town Engineer, Mass DOT, and Mass Historic. Um, we've used a variety of methods of keeping the community informed about the project. Um, the main one I would say is the town's webpage, which is a, a large repository of information. The town forums and meetings, there are over 30 articles, opinions, and letters published in local newspapers, and we also did some radio interviews. Uh, community input, uh, it sounded like you had 51 uh, letters just for this opening hearing. So in addition to that, more than 60 letters were written in the past and, and written comments were provided. We've had dozens of speakers, both pro and con, who've participated in public meetings. And there were some PowerPoint presentations uh, prepared by neighbors and abutters that were shown at the open meeting of residents. The housing program that's being proposed is uh, 28 small studio apartments. Uh, each apartment would contain its own bathroom and a kitchenette. Uh, common areas, including a lobby, a multi-purpose common room, a shared laundry, two on-site staff offices, one for property management and one for resident services coordinator. Some of the site features that we'll show you visuals of in a little while are 16 parking spaces, green dumpsters, an outdoor shed, covered bike storage, gardening areas, a designated smoking area, and robust new landscaping. An overview of the building is as follows. It's one single building. It is two and a half stories. 
Uh, it is three full floors. The half story is a below, partially below grade uh, story. Uh, it's 28 units. Uh, they're all studios. Two of these 28 are handicapped accessible. The average gross square foot for the units is 235 square feet. Some are a little bit smaller and some are bigger. Um, and the average for the accessible units is quite a bit bigger at 393 gross square feet. And the total square footage of the building is just under 12,000 gross square feet. In terms of the kind of technical aspects of who qualifies uh, to live in the proposed housing, uh, we are proposing 10 studios with a homeless preference for very extremely low income people earning below 30% of the area median income at a proposed rent, which is actually the current fair market rent with a subsidy, an in-house subsidy, so that these folks would be paying one third, approximately one third of their income for their housing costs. Two studios, again, uh, with a referral from Department of Mental Health for their clients also extremely low income individuals, again, having their own uh, project-based subsidy. Eight studios for low income uh, residents, earning below 50% of the area median income with a fixed proposed rent of $740. And eight studios, oh, sorry, I have a bad typo. This should be 80% AMI who are moderate income and the proposed rent is $795. Um, rents tend to, go up and down a little bit with the median income and the standards that are set by the state and the federal government. Currently, these are the income restrictions at these different income tiers, just to give you a sense of what the maximum income for this one person household would be. Um, if they, that one person household was paying 32% of their income for rent, this is what they could afford to pay for both rent and utilities. And so this is the range of people, income range of people who could afford the particular units that are being proposed. Who will live here? Um, the majority of studio apartments will house low and moderate income employed persons who are equally likely to be male or female. Um, we continue to have some misinformation circulating that this property will be only for men. Um, that has never been uh, something that we've proposed. Um, it's, it's based on application. We're not allowed to discriminate based on sex. So it will be a mix of men and women. Uh, a few quick statistics about Amherst housing uh, and income in general. An individual working 40 hours a week uh, for minimum wage would earn just under $25,000 a year. The median per person income am in Amherst is lower than that. It's about 20,000. The median single person household income is 28,000. The median rental household income for all size households, singles, doubles, triples, quads, is 20, only $28,290. 42% of Amherst renter households are severely cost burdened, which means they pay more than 50% of their income for their housing costs. So within this proposed um, housing, uh, eight studios would have an income cap of just under 30,000, which is 50% of the area median income. And as you can see from the numbers above, a large proportion of Amherst renters would be income eligible, uh, including service workers, laborers, maintenance staff, healthcare aides, and teaching assistants. Eight would have an income cap of 40, just under $48,000. Uh, income eligible persons might include uh, associate level administrative staff, paraprofessional social workers, and adjunct faculty. Two studios uh, for tenants referred from the Department of Mental Health with this lower income cap, uh, who may be employed full-time, part-time, or unemployed. Uh, they will receive regular and ongoing clinical and support services from the Department of Mental Health. And then 10 studios with a homeless preference, and again, a very low income um, threshold. So, uh, for our definition for this property, homeless persons are, are those who lack adequate permanent affordable housing. And in addition to people who might be in a shelter or living outdoors unsheltered, um, homeless persons can be defined as those who might be fleeing domestic violence, living doubled up somewhere with family or friends, living in a building that doesn't meet code, uh, paying more than 30% of their income for rent, which as we saw applies to 42% of the renter households um, in Amherst 
sorry, no, it's, it's an even higher number than that. Uh, in housing that was damaged by fire and natural disaster, uh, are needing to move due to a disability, or are separating, separated or divorced and cannot remain in the family home and cannot afford a second home. Um, the development is not limited to chronically homeless persons, which is defined as those who have a long-term or repeated homelessness coupled with serious mental illness, substance use disorder, or disability. And nationally, about 24% of homeless individuals meet the definition of being chronically homeless. Um, I'm going to talk for a minute about the subsidized housing inventory. This is in no way to um, disagree with what Attorney Witten told you. Um, in fact, Amherst does have more than 10% of units listed as eligible on the state's subsidized housing inventory. So according to the town, it has 1,211 units um, that are eligible for listing. Um, I updated the total housing units uh, from the most recent census data available, which is 10,294, putting the town at just under 12% of affordable units. Um, what a lot of people may not realize is of these 12, 1,211 units, about 356 are market rate units. So for example, only 26 of the units at of the 130 units at North Square are actually restricted as affordable. The rest are market rate, yet all 130 are counted on the subsidized housing inventory. Of the 204 units at Rolling Green, only 41 are restricted as affordable. The balance are market, but all of the 204 are counted on the subsidized housing inventory. Uh, the ratio of these truly preserved affordable units to the total units in Amherst is 8.3%. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development currently has a funding priority for communities with fewer than 12% of the housing stock listed on the subsidized housing inventory. Local preference. Uh, within Massachusetts, uh, cities and towns may request local preference from the Department of Housing and Community Development for up to, but not exceeding 70% of affordable units within the initial lease up lottery. Um, the state defines uh, local preference, current residents of the town, uh, people employed for business in town or working for the municipality, and people having children enrolled in the local school system. Um, there are uh, pros and cons to local preference uh, since housing is both a regional need and a regional resource. And there may be people who feel local, for example, someone who grew up in Amherst, who do not meet the state's definition for local preference. Um, and just a note, during the lottery process, the local preference pool must be balanced with minority applicants from other areas to match the percent of minority residents within the statistical area. Um, this is so that a local preference doesn't become a de facto racial barrier. Um, if there are not enough uh, local preference applicants, units can be filled from the open lottery pool. Um, we've had a lot of comments about you know, why, why build housing at this location for individuals and why not build a mix or why not build um, housing for families? So I just wanted to address that briefly. Um, in Massachusetts, there's a legislative mandate to shelter homeless families. There is no similar mandate for homeless individuals, creating dire need for individuals. Amherst has made strides to create family affordable housing. Both of Valley's, my agency's prior developments in Amherst benefit families. They're located on Charles Lane and Main Street. Other 40B projects approved by Amherst contain affordable family units. For example, Butternut Farm, Olympia Oaks, North Square, as does Rolling Green, Presidential Apartments, Mill Valley Estates, Village Park, and several Habitat for Humanity properties. In contrast, there has been no single person supportive housing created in Amherst, nor any housing built that is dedicated to homeless individuals. The site at 132 Northampton Road was selected in response to an extensive site search specifically to meet the need for single person supportive housing, including homeless individuals. It is proximate to downtown and to services. The power of the single person occupancy model is that it provides a home for persons who may lack social or familial supports. The proposed building has the potential to stitch together an extended family fabric for individu individuals who might otherwise be isolated. Um, as I've mentioned, this is a, a project a development that is intended to provide on-site supportive services for residents. Uh, these are voluntary services and some people will use them and some people won't. Some people will need them and some people won't. 
Um, the elements, the key elements of this service plan are an on-site dedicated resident services coordinator, approximately 27 to 30 hours a week. The functions of this uh, position include uh, connecting tenants and residents with community-based services, helping with any kind of daily logistics, coordinating on-site group functions, helping to resolve tenant conflicts, coordinating and providing transportation, and serving as a community liaison. Other aspects of the supportive services plan include signed memorandums of understanding with other community agencies, for example, Elliott programs, Amherst Community Connections, and the Veterans Agent to support tenants on an individual basis at the site. Uh, the Department of Mental Health referred clients will have ongoing regular clinical and service supports, kind of wraparound supports through the Department of Mental Health. Um, the selection process for homeless tenants will include a referral from a local agency. And that agency will commit to provide support for at least the first nine to 12 months of occupancy, potentially longer as needed by individual tenants. As these agencies exit, um, after that kind of critical first stabilization year, they will link tenants as needed with ongoing support services available through community-based agencies. The management staffing plan uh, includes property management by a company named Housing Management Resources. They are estimated to be on site approximately 20 hours per week. Their functions uh, include rent collections, compliance, maintenance, upkeep of the property, enforcing terms of the lease. Asset management will continue to be provided throughout the duration by Valley Community Development. We'll oversee the property management, we'll manage capital and operating reserves and major capital repairs, and we'll contract for the resident services coordinator position. A little bit more about the characteristics of the particular site. Uh, it is a central walkable location, four tenths of a mile from town center and then closest bus stop, six tenths of a mile from major shopping centers and walking distance to multiple service and healthcare providers, including the Musianti Health Center at the Bang Center. Um, it's on a main road uh, on a state highway, uh, Route 9, and it's connected to public water and sewer. Uh, it's a large buildable lot. Uh, it's cleared and fairly level for its location. It's in a mixed residential area. The butters include single and multifamily residential and institutional uses. It's sited at the junction of three different zoning districts, the ED, RG, and RN districts. The other types of dense housing uses that are nearby include a six unit condo, which is all rented. It's across the street. Uh, three residence halls that are on Northampton Road and a 78 unit assisted senior housing development. Um, this is a map showing the property location. Uh, it is here in this light green color. Uh, it's approximately halfway between the town center and town common and University Drive down in this direction. Um, as you can see, it is adjacent to the uh, athletic field, uh, the track, and the Conway Fieldhouse that's owned by Amherst College. The property almost surrounding it, all the way to over here, is owned by Amherst College. This is a two-family rental owned by Amherst College, and this is a single-family owner-occupied house. Um, in terms of proximity, uh, we're trying to highlight here the various things that are close to this property site um, of note is the rail trail is, is very close by. There's an urgent care center that's here. Uh, this is a senior housing development here. There's a church here. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that are close to where this project is sited. Um, as you move toward the center of town, you can see from the project site, um, the number of bus stops that are within walking distance. And then I'm not gonna review it because I think you all probably know all the things that are in town center. There's a blow up of the town center, Craig's Doors, Amherst Community Connections, the pharmacy, fire department, the library is close by, bus stops, bank, there's a bike share location, town hall, Museum Community Health Center, the bank center, post office, et cetera. Um, if you're moving toward the west, down toward University Drive, again, there are bus stops, there's another bike share location, there's two large grocery stores, uh, post office, some other pharmacy, 
um, et cetera. Um, here we're illustrating that this is the section of Northampton Road that's intended for improvement by Mass DOT. Um, and that would include improving and adding five foot wide sidewalks, multi-use paths on either side, both sides of Northampton Road that would be handicapped accessible. Um, it includes adding two crossings across Northampton Road that would have blinking lights. Uh, one is at Hazel Street and one is at Orchard Street. So from our project site, either walking toward town or away from town, there will be much safer opportunities to cross uh, Northampton Road. So uh, the planning board was interested in seeing how the scale of the property related to other properties nearby. So if you imagine this is Northampton Road, this is toward Hadley and this is toward Northampton. This is 132, the property in question. If you were standing across Northampton Road looking at it, this is how it would appear, partly because it's set about 100 feet back from the edge of the site. This is the neighboring property at 126, and then this is how these properties appear if you are kind of right in front of them. Same treatment here with the field house, and then with other houses as you head up toward the town center, and then properties on the opposite side of the road as well. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel to talk about site plans. Rachel, you're, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, as Laura mentioned, this is the location of the property on Northampton Road, next slide. Um, and this is what the proposed project would look at like. Um, one of the, the nice aspects of this design is that the massing of the building relates really well to a lot of the other you know, buildings in the neighborhood, which you can see from the aerial. Um, the footprint is really similar. Okay, next slide. So this view has rotated a little bit from those previous views. So Northampton Road is on the right hand of the page. Um, and Amherst College is to the left. So this is the, the view and orientation that I'll be talking to through the next slides. Okay, next slide. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, this, is, this is a survey of the site with a little bit of color to help, help it be a little bit more legible. The existing house is really set back far into the back portion of the property. It's within the setback. Um, it is, it is also the parcel which we found out later in the process has two zones uh, within it, the partially the ED zone and the R RG zone. So the green area shown there shows uh, a little over 1500 square feet of the ED zone that's in the parcel. Um, utilities coming into the site, as Laura mentioned, uh, fully uh, served by the city. Uh, the water line, which is shown in blue on this plan, uh, actually goes through an easement through the neighbor's parcel. Um, it is not sufficient to support the future building, um, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, overhead electric also comes through the neighbor's parcel, as does um, the sewer, a uh, sewer line uh, that, the, the, that the project connects to. Um, and then on the left are pictures of the existing site today. The view at the top is a view of the driveway looking back towards Northampton Road. Um, the view in the middle is looking at the west side of the, of the existing house uh, between the house and the field. And the bottom picture shows a view uh, looking towards the back of the property. Okay, next slide. Um, so, in the process of the construction, uh, we will take great measures to make sure that we are managing the site and construction. Um, and this is an example of the demo and erosion control plan that we would typically provide. Um, we call for silt sacks and silt fencing around the perimeter downslope areas, construction fencing, a tracking pad, um, and we itemize everything that's being removed um, for clear. Next slide. Uh, 
professional. And then on site, uh, we are using a variety of different materials, um, mostly for, for durability and then also what the final experience might be. Um, so the driveway today is gravel. Um, we would be, make it more stable and firm, um, paving a majority of the driveway, which is shown as Laura's pointing out um, in the lighter gray color. Uh, it's a 22 foot wide access drive. Um, we have eight spaces that are paved with asphalt, two of which are ADA accessible with an access aisle uh, bringing you into the main entry of the building. Um, we also would be using uh, grass pavers, which are shown there on the right. Um, the idea there is that we really want to kind of preserve the open feel of Northampton of this property um, and minimize the, the view of paving into the site. So grass pavers are something that we're going to use. Um, and we also suspect that this, this community may not need the full 16 spaces. Um, we're also looking at using really durable sidewalk materials. So there's a pedestrian sidewalk five feet wide connecting the building to a Northampton Road, uh, shown there in the light, light beige color, um, and also a concrete walk connecting to the, to the parking area. Um, in the back, uh, we have a dedicated uh, patio area, uh, which we're using unitized pavers um, to really make it feel more, more homey. Um, and then to reduce the amount of um, paving, forest paving, uh, we're using KBI um, or something called Flexi Pave, which has gained a lot of popularity with trail designs. It's a porous material. It's more like a, it feels like spongy, like walking on a track and it allows water to go through, but it has a nice a softer uh, feeling on site. So we'll use that to connect the patio to other parts of the site. Um, I think we're there maybe in a slide before that one, but yeah. Um, <laughs> slide showing the different examples of grass pavers and paving strategies. There is there is quite quite an abundance of options of colors and textures and sizes that we are thinking of. Okay. So uh, the place the placement of the building on the site is something that we've thought a lot quite a bit and it's moved around quite a bit through the process of design um, but we so we're the back corner of the building is a little over 27.6 feet from the back property line so we're expanding that three foot setback that was there before to a little bit more more comfortable uh, space behind the building um, which as Laura mentioned before gives us about a hundred feet from set back from the front of the Northampton Road, again, preserving that open feeling that's characteristic of the neighborhood. Um, and then to the neighbor to the east, uh, we have a little over 66 feet uh, between the building and, and the neighbor. And then I should also mention that um, in, in Amherst, uh, in addition to the RG zone setbacks of 10 feet uh, per side and rear, um, there's a clause for this type of development that we have to add uh, two feet for every story uh, to that side and rear setback. So um, we have 2.5 stories, so that's adding additional five feet. So we're, we're still within the 15 foot side setback and 15 foot rear setback for, for the, that requirement. Next slide. Um, this is a chart just breaking down what some of those requirements are and how we fit within those. Uh, the total lot size is over 38,000 square feet. The area of the lot that's in the ED zone is a little over 1,600 square feet. Um, the minimum lot size in RG zone, as you can see, is 12,000 12, square feet. We're well over that even after we subtract the ED zone area. We meet the minimum frontage. And as I talked to you through, those are the uh, rear and side setbacks. Um, building coverage, you know, in, in Amherst, there, there's a couple bullet points behind here at the bottom of the page that I pulled from the zoning specifically for uh, building coverage and lot coverage in max height. Uh, building coverage is the area by the main building and any structures that are enclosed by three sides. So um, we are well with underneath the max building coverage at 12.8%. Um, 
and the max lot coverage we're seeking a waiver for, we're a little bit over 45.29%. I will say that if, if this is conservative in the sense that we, we included the pavers as a impervious surface, if we were um, to consider the paver, the grass pavers as porous surface, um, we would be underneath that max lot coverage. Uh, and we have 2.5 stories, which is less than three stories. And, um, and Tom will talk us through more of the height things later in the presentation. Okay, next slide. So screening and fencing on site. In terms of fencing, um, there's already an existing ornamental rail fence between Amherst property and this property, which will remain for the project. Um, and then on the neighbor to the east, um, they had currently there is not a fence and there's a stand of evergreen trees, spruce trees. Um, the neighbor had requested that we provide a 12 foot high fence between their property and, and this project. Um, but we, we are proposing an eight foot tall sear fence for screening uh, and additional uh, lots of plantings on both sides, which we'll talk about later. Also, I'll mention that the, there's a dumpster enclosure at the back of the property um, hidden from view by the by a cedar enclosure fence six feet high. Okay, next slide. Um, and then I'm going to take you through in great detail all of the planting that we're proposing on this project. Okay, next slide. Um, so we're using a range of evergreen and deciduous trees and flowering shrubs. One thing that we We've been trying to take into consideration a lot now um, as things are changing with climate um, is to really think about plants that will do well in the future as it gets hotter and drier. Um, and also a lot of attention has been given towards pollinators and the need to support them. Um, so the, the example of the, the swamp white oak may support up to 300 or more um, pollinators um, and insects with its, that they may over time. And species like the black tupelo will do really, really well as things continue to change. Um, so those kind of provide the structure for the site. Um, also trying to, for the evergreen trees and evergreen shrubs, really trying to have a variety of texture and color um, so that we're not just putting down arborvitae everywhere. Okay, next slide. And similar to the, to the shrubs, um, we're looking at using some natives, some flowering, um, it's lots of seasonal interests, some color, um, lots of texture and habitat. Next slide. So now I'll walk you through the different zones of, of the project. So this is the eastern border. Um, the plantings there are going to span both sides of the fence, the seed, eight foot high cedar fence that I mentioned before. Um, here we're using um, different types, different spruces and different false cypresses that will stay evergreen throughout the year. And we're mixing in a couple more natives like the red twig dogwood and sweet fern, which are deciduous but provide a lot of, a lot of seasonal interest. Okay, next slide. The, moving towards the south, towards the Amherst College, Amherst College border. Um, we're keeping some of the same plants for continuity, um, but introducing some new ones. So more, more of the um, Eastern Sycamore and, and the Swamp White Oak. Next slide. And then on the Western border, similar there, using uh, evergreens all throughout the property really of different heights so that we won't have really tall evergreen trees with open views underneath for planting smaller evergreen shrubs underneath those also with a mix of um, shade trees also and flowering. Next slide. In the front area, still kind of that open pastoral feel, but with the uh, black tupelo along the front of the road, street state there providing more shade. Um, and then additionally in our stormwater area, more wet loving species like the swamp white oak. Um, and then 
dappling the site with some understory trees like a Japanese tree lilac and a red bud and then mixing in just a range of different uh, colors and textures like dwarf polaragelia and um, kalmia and berry and some sedges. Okay, next slide. Um, programming on the site, out, you know, programming is a, a fancy word for activities that are planned outside. Um, outside, we, as I mentioned before, we have an outdoor seating area, which provides a space for, for folks to get outside and take a breath of air and be outside amongst the vegetation or talk to other people living in the, in the building. Um, we're providing on our plans, we're showing five tables with up to 20 chairs that are all movable and arrangeable. So whether it's pre-COVID or post-COVID, social distancing. Um, we're providing spaces for gardening. We are currently showing four by four plots, 16 of those, um, both on the southern side and the, um, the western side of the project for a variety of growing areas. Uh, we're providing a covered bike shed structure. Um, it can hold up to 16 bikes and Right when we're thinking it'll be in the range of eight to 10 feet tall with a sloped roof. And we are proposing lighting underneath it. I'll talk about the lighting in a little bit. And then we have an outdoor pavilion seating area, prefab, um, that's uh, a little bit over eight feet tall. Um, and it's made of cedar and aluminum. Next slide. In terms of managing uh, waste on site and Tra trash, we've accommodated uh, space for two dumpsters, an eight yard dumpster and a six yard dumpster that can handle trash and recycling. Um, and we have tested out uh, a dumpster truck to make sure that it can turn around on the site. We're using grass paved areas to increase the paving apron for this area to accommodate those turns. Next slide. Um, also, managing the site, uh, we looked a little bit at snow removal. Um, the Valley CDC, um, sorry, the project will have sidewalks will be removed either with by a shovel or with a snowblower, um, and then parking areas will be removed by a plow company, um, either stockpiled on, on site if it turns out that the parking areas are not needed or into the periphery. And then on really big, heavy snowfalls, they may take some of the snow away. Next slide. As mentioned before, we have 16 spaces, eight of which are grass paved spaces, um, and then two ADA and six regular spaces. Thank you. Um, and accompanying this is a, is a traffic study and a, and a parking study. Um, Looking at this type of use, according to the ITE report um, and the number of units, we anticipate that the weekly ADT, max ADT, would be 188 for this total development. Um, but, sorry, but we, um, excuse me, at 188 total for this development. Um, but it, looking at it in terms of what's happening adjacent on Route 9, um, Route 9 has a much larger volume um, and MassDOT did a recent study accompanying their proposed work and their uh, max ADT is over 14,000 vehicles per day. Um, once we take into account that we're removing the single family unit from the site when we're at the end, we're adding the 28 units, we have 178 total ADT that would be contributing to the Route 9 traffic. So it is a much, it's a very small number added to the traffic on Route 9. Additionally, peak hours and peak trips, MassDOT uh, says that Route 9 peak hour use is a little over 1,300 vehicles an hour. Um, and from our project, similarly, on the max, this is again very conservative, the max number of trips from our site, according to the ITE, generator, trip generator, would be um, 27 contribution. So that's one vehicle every two minutes. Next slide. 
So the proposed site utilities are cleaning up some of those relationships that the, that the property has with uh, the municipal um, services. So now instead of going through the neighbor's yard for sewer and for, um, for water and electric, we're connecting to Northampton Road as much as possible. So we're proposing an eight inch ductile iron new water main to connect to the Northampton Road service. And that would split off into a two and a half inch water line for potable drinking water and a six inch fire service line for um, fire suppression. So this, this apartments will be sprinkled. Uh, we also are providing a new fire hydrant to help with um, fire control if that need ever arrives. And there's an FDC connection um, at the front of the building, which I'll show you on another slide. Uh, we're putting the electric utilities underground, uh, hopefully connecting to Northampton Road and uh, providing a transformer to the rear of the site. That's quite often that transformers would be required. So we want to move that out of the public realm, out of the public view and put it in the back of the site, um, which will provide service into the building. And then the sewer line, we would have a six inch gravity sewer pipe that connects to the existing system to the south of the project site. Next slide. Oh, and telecom also I'm providing an underground telecom line into the site. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the fire suppression system and the FDC connection and the hydrant, which are all supporting um, supporting our service folks uh, protecting this house of fire. Um, in conversations with with the fire department. Uh, it was requested that we provide a 20 foot five, 25 foot turning radius for vehicles. Um, and this is showing where, where that area would be located. Okay, next slide. Um, we also did a cut and fill analysis of the proposed work on the site. And um, in Amherst, anything over filling over, Filling over 5,000 square feet, more than two feet of fill, requires a special permit. Um, and we are filling more than that. Yeah, we are in the 8,000 range. And this graphic is showing you what areas are over two feet of fill. Um, and we had, we, wrote, we raised the site up a little bit to promote accessibility and the connection to the parking area, and also accessibility to the lower levels of the building as you walk out. Um, also, the site has high groundwater, and raising those portions of the site helped us meet all the stormwater challenges of the site. Next slide. And then this is a cut fill analysis of the entire site, not just what two feet of fill looks like. So we are cutting in places and filling in other places. The majority of the site, we're actually making subtle shifts of anywhere from zero to one foot. Next slide. So lighting, uh, this is a, an illustrative version of a lighting plan. Um, the lighting designers often will like grid out the site to show uh, what, and they measure the foot candles um, in a model on a grid, how, many foot candles are at any given point. And this is what we use to check to see and make sure that we don't have light trespass uh, beyond the property line. What that usually looks like is a black and white mess of <laughs> little dots and little numbers. So what I've done here is I've drawn shapes of yellow around um, any area that has more than zero foot candles. So the lightest shading uh, is 0.1 to one foot candle. And then the next darkest shading is one to two foot candles. And there's only a, one or two areas that are above two foot candles and that's right underneath the canopy at the entryway. Um, also, lighting can really, really change the way that a project fits within the neighborhood and also change the way it feels to live there. Um, one thing that I think many of us don't enjoy is feeling like you're under a spotlight or um, the cool the more cool lighting and the way we talk about 
color in lighting is through uh, Kelvin and temperature. So up 5,000 is very bright white light, um, blinding white light. Uh, and then the warmer tone lights are in the 2700 to 3000 range. So we've worked with the designer to make sure that every fixture is in the 3000 range so the site will have really soft, warm light. Um, we've also tried to keep the numbers down um, and keeping in mind that S'more has a more residential feel. So we did have to use some pole mounted lights and those are shown here on the left what those fixtures look like. Uh, with the shepherd's hook and a little, little softer feel. Um, those were needed to provide safety for the parking areas, but the pathways we chose to use really low bollard lighting um, that are, there's in the back we're using more of the 20 inch tall variety and along the front they're 36 inch high. All the fixtures are fully shielded um, and anything on the building is full cut off. And there, um, and we're trying. It's everything is dark sky, I should say. Um, and then uh, the lights will be dimmed at night on a timer. And uh, as I mentioned before, the lights on the pathways are motion sensor. So again, trying to minimize the amount of light on the site. Next slide. I'm just gonna add that these pathway lights are all solar powered lights. We tried to get everything solar powered, but we needed a little bit more oomph over here, but as much as possible, we're using solar powered lights. And it's all LED lighting as well. All right, we're gonna turn it over to Tom, who's gonna talk us through the architectural plans. You there, Tom? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. So um, this sheet shows uh, the views from the model that we did of the building. When, when we first started considering this project, we, we thought of, we were thinking of a, a building that was more modern and contemporary massing, similar to some of the newer buildings in Amherst. And that quickly became obvious that that was inappropriate for the site. Um, so we worked towards trying to break the massing down, make it more Victorian and sort of massing and roof and in details. Um, the plan has, floor plan has, a, it's broken up, it breaks the box up with a number of bays and recesses and those carry through to the roof, which ends up having, so you have, rather than having one mass of a gable, you have a lot of dormers. So each of those bays carries up and you have a gable over them. Um, and there's some hip areas. And that gives it a sort of a more Victorian massing. Um, we also have a stone base. We're trying to stratify the building a little bit, so horizontally. We have a stone base that is um, similar to the to the um, uh, to the field house next door, uh, and the the siding will be. Um, will be clabberds, it'll be all hardy plank, uh, it'll be a mixture of clabberds and possibly some shingles in the upper levels um, and fairly fairly uh, wide corner boards, uh, freeze, water table, things like that. Um, and then also there's uh, porches, a couple of porches, there's a porch that faces uh, the street and then there's obviously a porch that over the main entrance and some of the other egress that have little awnings over them. So it, just to orient you, the uh, upper right image is looking uh, across the driveway. Um, to the left is the main entrance of the building where you enter at grade. And then down on the right side is the porch that faces uh, the street. And the lower left, I mean, sorry, the upper left image is sort of back to the other side of the driveway. Um, the, the, that's the main car parking. The, Facade on the left side there is the one that faces the back. Um, and I guess I can say also right here, it's a little bit clear that the grades are not completely accurate in this, but um, in this model, but the part facing the, the driveway is, is really more like two stories and the, and the levels facing the back and the west are three stories. And the front is somewhat in between. Mm -hmm. Uh, next slide. 
here's a series of elevations. This is the front elevation. Um, the entrance is in the center, the port's facing the street. And that little box on the top is, a, is, a, is for the elevator. Um, next. That's the Northampton Road view straight on with the entrance on the left and the ports on the center. Next. Um, this is uh, the west elevation and on the lower right, there's a pair of doors that it opens out a grade to the patio. And beyond that is a, on the right is a retaining wall that helps with the transition to the higher level. And next. And finally, this is um, facing the south, the Amherst property. On, on the right, there's a little egress door. And on the bay to the left, there's a little dark overhang also. That's another exit at grade as well from the side. OK, next. This, uh, this slide is, so we're trying to compare uh, the height and massing of the existing building with the new. Um, the existing building has a walkout basement and a first floor and a second floor, similar to what, what we are doing. The difference really is that a couple things. The second floor in their case is tucked under the roof, which we can't do. And then basically the floor to floor heights have to be significantly higher to accommodate um, mechanical systems and the, the ceilings in that in that house are quite low. They're more like seven feet, seven and a half feet by and large. So the top shows you uh, back to back. That's, so that I mean that's the west elevation and that's the west elevation of the building. And then I had just a comparison with the front as, as well. Uh, next. So actually, Laura, can you scroll down a couple of slides to get to the section of the, I think it's just to, yeah, this. So um, just continuing on the building height, uh, the, so this, the image on the right shows that the, the has floor to floor heights, um, basic building section, and it shows the, the median um, building height as taken from the lowest level of the grade is uh, below the, the 40 foot. Um, the section on the left um, explains sort of how, the, how the whole structure of the building works with the grade. So that where the cursor is now, that is the, that's the outside entrance and then you come into the lobby, that's at grade to the parking lot. And once you're in the lobby, um, that's a mid, that's a sort of half level and you can either go down to the ground floor, which opens out at the lower level um, or you can walk up to this to the first what we're calling the first floor. That stairway right in the lobby is an open stairway. It connects the lobby and the two two other floors. Um, the third floor is accessed either by the elevator or or by stair towers at either end. So if we go back uh, to the plans, let's stop at the first. Go one more down, one more slide. Yeah, that one. So. Here you see again you enter you enter in that entryway and there's the lobby and there's an elevator that can take you either down or up down to the ground floor or up two floors and then there's an open stair that takes you either down to the ground floor or up to the first floor. If you were going if you wanted to walk and you were going to the to the second floor, you would go you could walk up this open stair and then you would wind down the hallway either way to get into the egress stair and then go up. So you could go down and up that, or you could go down. And alternatively, you could enter from the path at the at the um, north at, at the street side, the north end, and, and come in and go right up those stairs if your unit is right there. So now let's go back down to the ground level. Sorry. Uh, so this is the ground floor. Um, you come down the you come down from the lobby downstairs, and there's a there's a sort of open hall on the left. This is a common room which opens out to the patio at grade. Um, the, there's a, a common uh, restroom for people to use and there's a resident service coordinator offices here as well. Um, and then 
There is the laundry, common laundry services. And um, that's a electrical room there, utility room. And then there's also a stair next to the elevator. You go back up to the elevator. On the left of the elevator, there's a stair that runs down to a sub-basement. And that sub-basement is under the, under the lobby and that's gonna be more mechanical space and an elevator pit. Um, and then the rest of the floor has uh, basic units. Um, there are a number of different types, which we'll look at quickly, but uh, uh, this floor does not have uh, the accessible units. The accessible units is upstairs. So then if we go up one, we have in that corner above the common room, we have one of the accessible units. Um, and then we have uh, the property manager's office, which is over here. And that actually looks out um, over the lobby. So there's a window down into the lobby so they can, you can see what's going on there. Um, and then similar units. And if you go upstairs, let's go upstairs again. Um, there's, a, there's another accessible unit stacked and then uh, other units. So uh, maybe I can talk quickly about um, the construction. Uh, well, actually, talk about some of the safety features first. Um, I think we have, a, we have a slide for that. So um, we have the building is fully sprinkler, uh, the fire hydrant, there's hardwired smoke and CO detectors. And there are multiple fire uh, extinguisher, egress and extinguishers. Those two main stairs um, take you, once you get into those stairs, it's a fire rated enclosure and, and they both empty directly out into the exterior. Um, the construction of the building, or oh, the security, the building is locked with the intercom to each unit. And this is security camera coverage of the entries and egress and common spaces and peep holes in the unit doors. So the doors are normally locked um, and you will come to the entrance and buzz the unit to be let in. Um, the main entrance also has uh, uh, automatic power door opener for accessibility. I don't have, let's see. Um, in terms of construction, what's the next slide? Um, I'm gonna go back a little. Let's go. Let's go look at the units now. Sorry, I'm making you jump around. Um, there's a number of like every building. We try to standardize things, and then what happens with, because of all different kinds of requirements? There's a lot of different solutions. But there's base. There's like three or four different unit types. Um, they're all basically the same in that they you come in the door. You have a kitchen, kitchenette a little bit of storage, there's an area for a dining table, and an area for sitting and a bed, and then a, and then a bathroom. Um, the big exception to that is it's the accessible units, which are just basically have much more space around those features. Um, they have a roll-in shower and room to turn and more space access at the bed. Um, and those are a few more units that are basically different just because they're found at different locations in, in the building. But they all have the same similar features. Do you want to look at the roof at all? Yeah, I mean, the roof is... So in order to... <laughs> in order to uh, bring out the Victorian masking and character, we have... Uh, a lot of dormers. So basically, there's there's a two the structure is mainly two intersecting gables and then gable dormers everywhere. That breaks up the massing very nicely. Um, it makes it a little bit uh, difficult if we're since we're looking to put solar on it. But um, and the and the construction is a little more difficult, although it's built out of uh, trusses. There's no occupied space in the attic, so it's just trusses and overlay frame. We talked about this, we talked about the units. How about this one? So we have a, our goal really is to insulate 
and bring a level of airtightness to the building that reduces our energy loss to the point that um, we can get a passive house certification and require very uh, low uh, energy expenditures to heat and cool the building. So we have a, we'll have an envelope that is, is, has, pays very great attention to our air, reducing, eliminating air infiltration and adding is, is, uh, high levels of insulation. Um, because we're reducing the air infiltration to such an extent, we, we're spending a lot of time having, uh, bringing in fresh air. And that's gonna be done by um, ERVs, energy recovery ventilators, which will um, serve, provide fresh air to each apartment and ventilate air from each apartment. And they, they're energy efficient because they recover energy. The, as, the, as the air is exhausted, it transfers energy from the exhaust air into the incoming air. And those will be run um, all the time. And they will, they will exhaust bathroom and kitchen air and provide fresh air into the living areas. Because we're reducing the energy costs, I mean, the energy demand so much, we're going to have, we can have a small and efficient um, heating system, which will be a, an air source heat pump. It will provide cooling and heating, and we will also have hot, uh, heat, heat pump hot water heaters. So there's no going to be no um, <clears throat> uh, combustion appliances on, on site, no electric, no fossil fuels. The goal, I mentioned a little bit of the problem with the roof, but the goal is to add some solar panels where we can um, to offset the, the uh, electric energy bill. Um, it's an efficient building. It's pretty compact. We have tried to limit um, exterior envelope as much as possible and still keep an, you know, an attractive uh, massing. So the building, the units are efficient. Um, it's in a walkable location, close proximity to services, shops, medical facilities, and the bike trail. Um, and hopefully that reduces the number of tenants who own cars, which all contributes to its low carbon footprint. Um, the building is, is fully accessible in public, in its public areas. So all the walks are uh, slopes that uh, less than 5%. It had, it's a, all the entrances are accessible um, they, at grade. Uh, there's an elevator. There will be two, two of the units will be fully uh, handicap accessible and they're larger as we saw in the plan. There'll be one additional unit adapted for a tenant who may have sensory impairments. Um, the other units will be adaptable and designed so that uh, they're visitable. Um, I think we got. I think we got all of that. Okay. Um, is there anything else, Tom, that isn't here that you wanted to say about the building itself? I'm just scrolling back to see if you. Yeah, I think I think most of it. Okay, we may get questions for you. Um, I'm just going to quickly highlight the zoning waiver requests. Um, they're listed out in quite a bit of detail in the application. But um, these are what I would think of as some of the highlights. Uh, the number of units in apartment buildings, we're asking to have 28 instead of the 24 maximum. Uh, the density of units to allow these 28 units. Parking, allow 0.57 spaces per unit or 16 spaces total. Uh, maximum lot coverage we talked about being a little bit over the 40% normally permitted. Um, and to basically allow the comp permit to encompass all of the other town permits. Uh, water and sewer connection, site plan review, demolition delay, uh, et cetera, with the ZBA con consulting with the relevant town departments or boards. Um, Want to share a little bit about next steps. Um, assuming that the ZBA were to grant a hearing, we, we assume we'd have hearing and permitting during the course of this summer. Uh, might allow us to apply for uh, funding in the winter um, and if we were successful, uh, we would hear about that funding next summer. We would work to select a general contractor and close on construction 
and begin construction in the spring of 2022. Uh, we'd have a marketing period as well as a tenant lottery that would kind of coincide with while the construction is underway. Uh, completing construction maybe a little more than a year later than it was uh, started, uh, about usually a three to six month uh, period to lease up all the units. And then what we call stabilized operations is when you have a few months of fully occupied operations, the end of the year 2023. And I think we're at the end of our presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for that presentation. One of the things that Massachusetts open meeting law requires is that questions, as questions asked at the site visit be introduced into the record in the public hearing. So what I wanna do is go over some of those questions that were asked at the site visit. And then I will um, turn the, turn, we can go through those. I will then turn it over to other members of the ZBA uh, to ask their questions. I have some other questions which I can ask at the after other questions from my, my fellow ZBA members are, at, are asked and answered. But I wanna go through those, make sure those questions that were asked at the, at the site visit are put into the record. Um, so it, let's go to the, the trees, uh, the uh, landscape design first, Laura. Sure. Uh, could we look at, I know there was lots of, there were lots of, uh, questions um, around tree removal, replanting, and all that. So and sure. specifically, let's tell me what, what uh, plan we should be looking at, which um, piece of paper which should we sure. look at that will help us with that. Okay. I'm going to ask for help from Rachel, but so in terms of what is being removed from the site, there should be a plan that's a uh, demolition plan. Uh, that would include demolition of the house, as well as removal of any trees that are not going to remain on the site. Um, the majority of trees that are there now are slated for, for demolition. Um, and so, then, so this demolition plan will identify each tree that's going to be removed or just, yep. just shows the trees that are going to be replanted. It shows, it identifies the trees that will be removed. I yeah. believe it does. Yep. L does it? Okay. I'll see 101. Um, 101? I'll we'll see 101, yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So practically, so all the trees abutting the neighboring property are going to be removed, correct? That's the request. Yep. yep. Laura, I guess. Um, yes. Rachel, I'm having a hard time hearing you, so I'm just probably breaking up. All right. I said at the request of the neighbor. Yes. Um, we talked about the grass pavers at the site. We understand that that's cement with spaces that grass can grow. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, another question was why um, you, you alluded to this a second ago, uh, Ms. Loeffler. You said that the trees would be removed at the request of the neighbor. Uh, and there was a question asked at the, at the site visit about whether there was any thought given to planting trees between the existing trees to try to provide a screen instead of taking down how many of those, um, it's not listed here on 101, but it's, there's a number of uh, spruce trees there. There must be 10 or 15 spruce trees that you're gonna take down. Laura, do you wanna answer this one? Had conversations. Sure. Um, yeah, we have looked at a number of different options. One of them um, was retaining those trees and putting a fence on our side of the trees and then putting some plantings there. Um, it, you can plant things under spruce trees. It, it limits the type of variety I would think that you could plant because it's, it's pretty heavily shaded there. Um, but it's certainly something we looked at. Um, we did get the request uh, from the abutter to remove those trees and to provide something new, which was uh, the eight foot cedar fence, as well as plantings that we would provide on our side of the lot, as well as potentially on their side of the lot if they would like some plantings on, on their land as well. 
And what's the nature of those? What species trees are you looking at on that level, uh, on along that um, property line? Sure. So that Rachel went through that section, and we can provide this whole presentation to to the ZBA to be posted. I, I suggest that's probably the simplest way. So she broke out the different planting areas and gave pictures and names of the different species that would be on there. Yep. So which plan um, identifies the species, the planting plan, Rachel? What is it? Well, it's more important. The height. I think the height is more important for this the question that was asked at the. At the uh, site visit, the height. Uh, the the plants are also um, on LC one one one, and there there are plant. There's a plant legend with sizes and quantities, uh, and the symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, the symbol correlates to the scientific name, um, and the trees that we've planted there are will grow to a range of heights. Um, but what comes at, what comes from the nursery is installed at a smaller smaller height. So many of the evergreen trees come at eight foot heights, five to eight foot heights at install, but they will grow to twenty or thirty feet high. Sure. So at install, we'll have they range from five to eight feet along yeah. that property line. Okay. Um, there was a placement. We talked about the placement of the fence going to the bike path. And that seems to me you you describe that in your presentation. So I think that issue was um, mentioned already in the meeting. Um, Do you mean the bike shed? The bike shed, yes. Excuse me, not the bike path. The bike shed, yeah. <laughs> That'd be a long fence to the bike yeah. path. The bike shed, yes. Yeah. Um, did you look at alternatives to asphalt paving? Was another question. Yeah. So we did talk about that at the site visit, whether we could use instead of asphalt, um, porous pavement. Um, and we did consider that um, because of the high groundwater on the site, we did not think it was gonna be a successful application of porous pavement because it has to be able to percolate down mm -hmm. and go somewhere. Um, but as you've seen, we do have about at least half of the kind of stabilized um, parking and driving areas are uh, the grass grass creek instead of uh, bituminous pavement. But the long run of driveway would be a bituminous pavement. Yes. Okay. Um, you, one question was about the ADA um, compliant rumble strip at the end of the driveway that, along the sidewalk. Um, can, you didn't talk yeah. about that in the presentation. Uh, could you just describe that for us? Sure, those are, those are standard um, to be provided when a sidewalk intersects a, a drive. It's a way that someone who's visually impaired, who might be using a cane, can feel uh, a notice that they're about to um, cross traffic with a vehicle. Um, so those, those come in different sizes. Uh, standard is like a two, two foot by three foot pad that's cast in the concrete and it has a dome and it can be metal um, or it can also be a, uh, concrete concrete pavers but we would, it needs to be a contrasting color so we have two of those provided um, on both sides of our drive um what's the time we were asked about the timing of the construction on route nine now i know it's a, it's a state project you can't commit to the to the um t the timeline but what do you know about the state's plans and how would you sure. represent the timing um, well, the state has uh, just contacted us for an easement. Um, I believe they are at 95 or 100% uh, design development. Um, I think they're looking at construction over two seasons. I think it might be next summer and the summer after. Um, there's a lot going on in our economy and it, it could shift, um, but they've at least designed the full system. So it, and, and they're queued up in the funding stream to do the work. Mm -hmm. Um, my guess is, is they would begin construction before we would, um, and our, our hope is to co just coordinate the plans so that if we need to tie into the water line in Northampton Road, which is our desire, um, they would stub that out across, you know, during the point of construction, even if we weren't under construction yet. So I don't know exactly who's going to finish first. Um, my guess is they will, uh, but either way, we would do our best to coordinate our work with their work. 
Um, one of the questions was whether the existing building would be demolished. That, of course, is the case. We did ask, and that was that you represented that here in your presentation. The cost of the building itself and the per unit cost was sure. a question that was asked as well. Sure. Um, so when we look at the total budget for the project and we break it down by the units, we're at about 265,000 per unit. Um, that includes all the common areas, the offices, the elevator, the cost of the land, everything kind of rolled into one big, what they call total development cost, divided by 28 is 265,000. I believe we're budgeting about $250 a square foot for construction. Um, so even though these units aren't large, um, they are expensive on a per square foot basis because they all have kitchens, they all have bathrooms, we have an elevator. So it's, it's this type of construction, it's a little misleading to just look at it on a per unit cost. Um, but we think it's pretty competitive on a, on a square foot cost with other types of affordable housing cost in our region. So total cost of the building is someplace around seven point five million dollars. So to, not the, the building, but of the of the project is about seven point five million dollars. Correct. Okay. Another question was about landscaping to the to landscaping in front of the building to shelter it, the noise from Route Nine up to the building. Um, can you walk through with us how you're doing that on the landscaping? Use of trees and shrubs to. Yeah, we have a buffer um, noise. Immediately at Northampton Road, we have um, four uh, Nissa Sylvatica um, shade trees. And then moving into the property, we have Quercus bicolor, um, big oak trees. And then we have, um, we have some pines and we have, um, we have some just a mix of other shrubs like the uh, feather gilia and um, we've got um, there's some Japanese tree lilac and some understory trees as we move closer into the building. Uh, we have a mix of evergreen and, and flowering shrubs. So there are lots of layers both vertically and horizontally. Um, we could also densify that even further but that would change the character of that open open feeling uh, between the road and the building. Mm -hmm. I would add, I would, oh, sorry. Mr. Langsdale. Uh, I think it would behoove us, while you're talking about these plantings, if we can get, rather than just saying we have an oak and we have some pines, uh, if we could understand what kind of pines, like, the pine trees along the driveway that they want to take down are, I don't know, 50 or 60 feet high, but there are no branches for the first 25 or 30 feet. So they are give, they give no, uh, uh, they don't block anything. So if we could understand that with what they're going to replace all of these plantings they take out, what they're going to replace them with, their size, their height, how high they're going to grow, what kind of cover they're going to give, how full they are, uh, rather than just stating we have pines and oak and whatever else. Do you want me to try to answer that now, or is that? I think or... that needs to be a, a further, I, I, Mr. Langsdale, I think you'd agree, that seems, I think that needs to be an additional submission where we could go through, because you could tell it to us now, and it would be, I think it'd be more helpful to have a, um, a, a, an additional drawing or an elevation in some way to represent that. Okay. But you understand the concern that voiced by Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, and it's something that informed how, which, which species we chose. We chose some little guys that stay low, that max out around eight feet. And we've paired them with the, with the bigger guys that get 30, 40 feet high, so. Um, so is, is the main question, what will this landscaping look like once it's matured? Because it looks very different when it's matured than when you first plant it. So is that what we should be aiming to show the, the board? Yeah, I, I think also the question is uh, a couple of questions. Uh, yes, what is it going to look like when it's matured? 
What is it going to look like when it's planted? How long will it take to mature? And what will it look like? Next meeting. I'm sorry, what? I think somebody was meant, to, that was just inadvertent conversation. Go ahead, Mr. Oh, Langston. All right. Um, no. And, uh, um, okay, well, I lost my train of thought. Uh, anyway, but you were, so that's, you were yeah. that you wanted to see something for what it would look like for the first in initial planting and what we could what we'd expect to see when it is fully mature. Yeah, they're the two different representations, right? Okay, is that clear, Ms. Loeffler? Yes. Good. Can I add one thing in terms of buffer and sound? There is a lot of traffic noise from Northampton Road. Um, because we're looking at doing a passive house building, at least when you are in the building, it will be extremely quiet. We'll have double, triple pane windows. We'll have very thick walls. So just wanted to share that with the group. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, it appears Ms. O'Mara has a question. Oh, yes, Ms. O'Mara. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you all for your very hard work. Um, just a clarification on those spruce trees again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have to consider a waiver on the eight foot fence. If, if we don't give that a waiver, does the abutter still want those trees down? I can't, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think we need to have a consideration for that. And if there can be a dialogue with the abutter, that if the zoning board doesn't agree to an eight foot fence, do they still want those spruce trees down? That would be helpful for me. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. One of the other questions we had was the location of a smoker's um, pavilion, and uh, you've shown that on the on the plan. Um, we did have a question of the removal of the apple tree at the very back of the property. Is that tree going to go? It is it shown going in the plans, but we looked at the grading and we can tweak the grades um, to help keep it. It'll reduce the amount of usable space near the building, but um, we can shift, we sh can shift the grades for that. Um, but we talked about the height of the building. You've taken care of that in your presentation and uh, we've measured the members of the ZBA went out to try to measure how an eight foot fence, which sh would uh, shield the view of the, the new building from the existing abutters. Um, and it looks like from the front door, if I remember right, it looks like from the front door with an eight foot fence, you pretty much can't see much, you can't see much of the house at all, the abutting house, is that, so if you could provide some kind of a, um, a drawing that shows from a, a standing pr a perspective of a person standing on each side of the property, how the eight foot fence shelters the, um, or shields the, the existing, house from the new proposed residence, that would be helpful. So you, is the main concern the neighbors look at what the neighbors are looking at, or is it the main concern what our new tenants will be looking at? Well, I, I, I think it's both, but it's, okay. it's more that I think it's both. Um, I'm, I can imagine that the existing, that the, the abutters have that question and it may come up with your, your future tenants as well, but I think both. And I think that was all the all the questions that we were um, that were asked at the the site visit that were not um, we didn't specifically deal with yet. So I, what I'd like to do is turn this over to other people on the other board members to ask questions. And I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Langsdale, if you would, if you have questions at this time. Uh, yeah, I have a few. Um... One of the things that uh, is part of your presentation is uh, concerns the walking distance to town and to the shops um, along uh, Northampton Road. Uh, you have listed that the, um, 
wait a minute, uh, that the walking distance to the shopping uh, to the west is six tenths of a mile. Is that a return trip? It's one way. One way. Yep. So it's over a mile down and back at yep. least. Yep. Um, and then to town, it's how long, how, how far is that generally? Four tenths of a mile. To where in town? To, I think to the nearest bus stop, which is right around the corner, um, kind of across from the common. Okay, so, right. So, but it's not to the main, uh, the shops and stuff. Um, one of the things I think we need to see, and this has to do with the eight foot fence as well, is, um, a discussion, uh, a presentation, a representation of the uh, difference in uh, the levels of uh, that area. Because you're on, that's a very steep uh, incline that uh, you're on, on Northampton Road. So the six tenths of a mile down to the shops is downhill, that's nice. Coming back, it's all uphill. It's uphill to town and downhill coming back. The eight foot fence, that the house that's next to you is uh, much more elevated than your property. Yep. So an eight foot fence really isn't going to block anything for them. Uh, it, I, well, I don't know what it would be. But so I think the, it's important that we get a, a sense of the difference in heights, the, of uh, the terrain that that is that not just your property but what's next door and and uh what tenants would have to deal with in terms of riding a bicycle or walking um down or up um, you also at one point in your uh presentation uh showed that the, uh, the, the people, the, not the property management, but the other folks in the other office who are there to uh, assist the, uh, the people living there. You, yeah. One of the points you made with, was that they would provide transportation. What transportation mm -hmm. is that? Um, I think we would look for them to provide one-on-one -on -one transportation to a limited extent for tenants. I think more of their job would be coordinating rides. So there's um, accessible van service in town. There, you know, there could be there will be tenants who have cars, so there can be rides and trips that are coordinated with tenants. Um, so I, I don't imagine them driving every person around every day. Um, but trying to maximize people's ability to use different types of transportation systems. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the, um, you say also in your presentation that, uh, that it, the occupants are not limited to the chronically homeless. Who then, if, besides the chronically homeless, what does, what encompasses the people of, uh, who are uh, able to apply for and move into your place? Sure. So the 10 units that have a homeless preference Someone may be homeless, but they may not be chronically homeless. Um, the remainder of the units, for, essentially it's an income restriction. So you need to be within a certain income range to qualify. You, you know, we do references, we do quarries, you have to be a good tenant, all the usual. So could, would, would that include students? Um, it does not include students. Uh, the funding that we're u using, um, is not intended for full-time undergraduate student housing. So there's a definition, which I can provide to the board, of what who qualifies as a student who could live in the property. For example, uh, someone who's an, a working adult taking vocational classes could live in the property, but a full-time undergraduate student could. How about a graduate student? Depends on their age and 
um, there's a number of criteria. I can provide them to you. It's, okay. it's you know, the idea is that we're not trying to subsidize the housing of people who are dependents of other people who might have more resources. That's right. the concept. Nor are we trying to punish people who are adults who are trying to improve themselves. So right. I'm trying to split that. Um, okay, uh, the bike shed. Um, yep. The picture that you provide has a, a platform of, I don't know, four to, four to six inches. And then it has a cover with some posts, four, I think it's four posts at each corner. But there's nothing inside it uh, to, uh, I mean, a lot of bikes don't have kickstands. Oh, sure. There would so be, they, there would be a U or a S or we would have a bike stand within it so that people could lock their bikes to something and keep them upright. It's okay. an incomplete picture. And I also think it might just be on a pad on the ground, so you're not having to lift your bike up. It was really just to give an impression of what scale and type of thing we were talking about. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think it would be necessary for us to have a picture of exactly what you're talking about, rather than a, a vague representation. Okay. Um, the lighting, the pole lights, there are four lights uh, for the parking. What are the heights of those poles? I think we know. Hang on. They are 15 feet high. 15? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would I would say that for a, re a residential, t you're, you're trying to make this residential looking, yep. for a residential type place, 15 feet is extremely high. I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong item. It was the product number for the meteor light. Um, the pole mounted lights are on a 12 foot base. 12 foot. Okay. Well, we can talk about that. We've, we've recently done a project that is a, an apartment building um, where the light poles are 10 feet and eight feet. Once again, to not give it a commercial look. Uh, 12 and 15 foot uh, pole lights are much more commercially oriented. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I think we'd wanna look at that. Um, Mr. Langsdale, can I add something to you? Sure, to, sure. Long on, long, long on that subject. You know, I, you provided the, um, the highlighted yellow um, yellow highlighted lighting plan and you mentioned how that, you, that it was difficult to read a normal pho photovoltaic plan with all the little numbers um, but I think we should have that pho photovoltaic plan submitted to us and not rely upon just the uh, the representation that you had on your presentation of yellow varying degrees of yellow so sure. if you could if, I think we should you should provide that to us Okay, so that it's called a photometric plan, and it's in your packet. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, not, I can't. I can hardly yeah. read it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I know. We need. I, I can't read it. So, okay. um, can we, we get can a make bigger. The bigger. We can make the numbers bigger. And then, but I think you need to adjust it for the other lights that Mr. Langsdale was talking about. A lower, lower for eight to ten foot lights as opposed to 12 to 15 foot. Okay. Yeah. See what the difference would be. So we'll, we'll revise the plan to accommodate a, an eight to 10 foot light and show darker tick marks and numbers. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, also then, uh, in terms of lighting, um, the windows in the building, will the, how will they be shaded? Um, most often we do a kind of mini blind. Okay, just so that there's a way to block off a, a, for the nighttime, you know. Um, and also, uh, do the windows open? Yes, these are double hung windows, right, Tom? Is that what we're thinking? Or are they casement? You're muted. Uh, there, I think a lot of them are gonna be, I think they're leaning towards casement, actually. Okay. Um, but they so and better energy performance. Right. So they'd have a crank to open them. Typically they only open a limited way for right. fall right. protection, but yeah, you can open them, they'll have screens. 
Okay, good. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, the height of the building is uh, 40, 44, 11, 44, almost 12 inches um, to the very top. Yeah. 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 There, uh, in the proposal, they, it, it was said that uh, there would be three floors of apartments and other things, but uh, originally, I think uh, it was proposed that the attic would have some living spaces, but now you're not going to have living spaces in the attic. What is the purpose of the attic? What will it be used for? It, it's the, the attic is not is not occupied. It's it's basically what's left over to build the you know the, to roof the building. Right. So it's going to be framed with roof trusses. Um, it will have sprinklers in it, and it will have to have an access hatch to get in there. But it's going to have about twenty five inches of cellulose insulation. Okay. Good. Okay. No access. Um. Okay. That's all for now. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Ms. O'Meara, Ms. do you have questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Ms. Parks, do um, you have some questions? I do. Um, thank you for the presentation. You're Very welcome. Thorough. Um, if someone were to um, come who had a small child, would that is that something that you would consider someone with a, an infant? So it, it, a lot of it depends on the size of the particular unit. So um, the state sanitary code dictates that if you have more than one person, you need 250 square feet of habitable space. So some of these units are literally just, they're not made for more than one person. Some of them are over that dimension um, and it, it, we don't have any right to, to tell people they can't come with an infant. Um, you know, we have had tenants living in this type of properties who've uh, become pregnant or reunified with their children. And usually our approach has been to try to move them into some more suitable, larger size apartment um, that they can afford. And it may take some time to do that. Um, but it's not designed really as family housing. It's really, it's, I think it's highest and best use is for single individuals. All right. And Oh, sorry. I was going to say there's four units that are 266 square feet. And then the and two accessible units are just under 400. And then you were talking about having a property manager there for about 30 out, 20 to 30 hours a week, and then someone who would um, uh, coordinate services. Is any, would anyone be there on the weekends? Um, not necessarily, although the resident services coordinator position, you know, could have weekend hours if there was demand for that. I think we'd have to kind of see where the ebb and flow of resident demand was. Um, we could, I mean, that will be our contracted employee or subcontracted employee, so we can set up whatever schedule seems to make sense uh, for that position. And is there something like a 24-hour call number or something yeah. like that in yeah. case yeah. somebody's not doing well? Yeah. So, well, there's two things. Uh, property management has a 24-hour emergency call line, which okay. typically people call for property issues. Sometimes they call for other things. Um, and then we don't have a 24-hour person necessarily for a, a mental health kind of crisis, although there are community lines for that type of crisis. Okay, and and I'm sorry to go back to this, but I, I also have a concern about that line of trees, and I don't, I'm not, um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not a good tree identifier, I don't, are those spruce, are they hemlock, what are the, what is that line of trees? Does anyone know uh, between the two properties? I do know, I think it's a type of spruce. I did talk with the tree warden and I can, I can find, he told me the name of them, but I don't remember. Do you know, Rachel, what those are? I, I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm going to double check. 
All right. I just, uh, my concern is that because the property is sloped, it seems like those trees actually would help with erosion. And because it's a moist area in Amherst, it also seems like they would help with um, moisture, with um, taking up some of the moisture. And the other thing is today I drove up and down Route 9 and those trees really block that house, uh, the neighbor's house. Um, from that property, from the pro from 132, and almost all the way down to University Drive, as you look up, you see that stand of trees. And I went all the way down to Lincoln Avenue and looked back, and you see that stand of trees. And I, I honestly think that it will create a bold spot uh, if those trees are removed. And I also, you know, there are there's the the you know kind of a mature apple tree on the property and and other trees. I would just ask that preserve whatever trees you can. Um, I did see that in that stand of trees along the driveway, there's 35 trees there. 24 of them are very large trees and about 11 of them are really skinny trees. And so, um, you know, I, I do think, I, I wish that we could uh, keep those trees. So um, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's any deter deciding factor for me, but um, you know, I just wish that, uh, take another look at, at the trees and see if we can preserve those. That's it for me. Thank you. All right, Mr. Park. Um, Mr. Maxfield, do you have questions? Yeah, I just have one that I wanted to uh, ask. So we're here asking you, uh, you folks again, to reach out to that immediate abutter to, um, to the east there uh, about that trees and alternatives to cutting them down, what their thoughts on that would be. Um, also like to hear uh, from them as well, what their feelings would be on the size of those lights that um, are going to be facing the parking lot. Um, what they thought is on a, a 10 versus an eight foot is as well as I think they will be um, one of the residents seeing those lights the most. So I'd like to know if you can get what their thoughts on that are, uh, I'd like to hear that. Okay, thank you. That's it, Mr. Lang, Mr. Maxwell. Any other questions? No, that's it for right now. Okay. All right. I've got a couple additional questions then, Laura, that I'd like to ask. Um, on supportive services, uh, has the extent of the supportive services that you have, that you intend to su supply or, or, or to um, connect tenants with, either that you supply or you connect tenants with. Has that been described <laughs> other than the, the slide we saw tonight? Is that described in some place in this application? Yeah, so it's referenced in your application in the management plan. It references- Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so on the top Oh, <laughs> it's been posted on the town's website since May. So if you go into the PEL, it was part of the PEL application. So if you go into that section, you'll see supportive services plan and the whole plan, the whole draft plan is posted and you're welcome to take a look at it. Okay, Ms. yeah, all right. So one, first off, what's PEL? <laughs> so the project eligibility letter was the letter that came from the state that allows us to apply to you for the comprehensive permit. Okay. And then that supportive services plan, will you provide, can you, pro can we get that, the staff, can we get that distributed to the members? So Maureen, can you get that from the or PEL so and distribute? I, so I will submit that to the board. Yeah, so we can have that. So we don't have to go looking for it. I think that's an important part of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the application. Um, so I, I know that the town, I, this is a question about the finances. I'm just not clear. The town has provided 500,000 of um, Community Preservation Act money. And there was yep. some earlier, earlier money than that as yeah. well. So it is around is it six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars that the town has provided? Seven fifty. Seven fifty. And is that used for planning and preparation? So if this so, doesn't. 
sorry, I didn't Go mean ahead. to interrupt. It's both. Right. So the first 50 is spent and gone. It was really to identify a site and do very early feasibility analysis. The second 200, we've only used a little bit of. It's for design and planning. The last 500 is for construction. So if we don't succeed in a obtaining all of our financing and permitting and going under construction, the town never spends that last tranche of CPA money. Got it. Uh, um, if, if we keep on the um, financing issue, there was a, a reference to a state fund for financing um, at some point where you, when on the timeline, you describe yeah. how you have to get uh, approval from the state for, for financing. Can you describe Correct. what that would be? Sure. Um, most affordable housing in Massachusetts at some point um, goes to the state. They're the main distributor of both uh, state bond money and federal funds. They have an application round. It's called a one stop. Um, the idea is you go in and you can ask for multiple state and federal sources in one gigantic application. And it typically happens only once a year. Um, it's usually sometime in the winter that they'll announce that round. Um, and if we are ready, we will go in and apply for those funds. And we'd be pulling from probably six different sources within um, what the state has able to, is able to allocate. Uh, the largest source is called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. It's actually not public money at all. Well, it kind of is. It's tax credits. It's equity that comes from investors in exchange for tax credits at the federal level. Um, so that's the single largest source of financing that we would be seeking. And your hope is to get $7 million from that fund or for the, and so, to add to the 700 and some yeah, thousand you now have yeah. from the stuff. Okay. So in the, I will just tell you in the project eligibility letter, there are budgets also um, that identify all the different sources. Um, we have committed a bunch of local money, which is great. It makes us much more competitive when we go to the state. Um, they would look very, very favorably on a project like this that is for a low income vulnerable population uh, in a nice community to live in. Um, so we don't doubt that they would support it. Um, it's really just having all the having all our ducks in a row so that we have a clear path and then we can go and seek funds from them. And the 265,000 per unit is extremely low relative to what the per unit cost is in the state. They're, they're not seeing much below 400,000 these days. And they're trying not to go above 500,000. So most projects are coming in between four and 500,000 per unit for affordable housing development in Massachusetts. And there's, of course, it's, it's incredibly expensive to do these very small units. Uh, it is you have, you yeah. have to use a bathroom, you have a bathroom and a kitchenette yeah. for 250 square feet where if it's on right. one bedroom, right. you may just have one bathroom for 600 square feet, right? Right, yep. And those are the cost intensive features. Those are cost intensive using the state and federal programs are cost intensive to be honest in terms of our attorney's fees and other kinds of design costs. So um, it, Massachusetts is a, it's a heavily regulated state and it's, it's a housing, it's a state where housing and construction is expensive. Yeah. Um, is the, the role of the residential services coordinator described fully in the supportive services um, piece that's connected that with your yeah. PEL letter. Yes. Yeah. So if I get that, I will have a description of the supportive services resident, supportive, I'm, the resident services coordinator's job. Is that correct? I, I believe it's fully described. So there's a description of the duties. There's actually a job description in there. So mm -hmm. if you look at that and you still have questions, please um, let me know. We may that's we may talk about that in one of the other. When we get the information, we'll review it, and we may have questions about it in sure. future hearings. Sure. Um, let's see. Will there be supportive services provided at the site, or just will they be? Will you just meet match client tenants and with supportive services offsite? Both. Both. So okay. um, the plan, it, the plan is really about linkage. So some things like, you know, seeing a dentist, you're going to probably need to go to, 
Um, other things like we had the, the public health department offer to come on site and do some clinics, you know, they can do flu shots and other kinds of clinics. So there's some services that it makes sense to bring on site. Um, I would say the majority of services people are going to need to probably go somewhere to. And then social workers and therapists, it's a little bit of both. Some, especially for homeless folks, often the, the providers end up coming to people because they have no transportation and it's just easier that way. So it will be both. Yep. Um, one thing I didn't see on the drawing is, um, and maybe I missed it, is the distance between the new structure and the closest wall of the existing house, um, the existing abutters. I'm, I'm not sure that I saw how, how far away you are from, the new building will be from the existing house. And can okay. you provide that to us? The new building from our neighbor yep, at 26. Right, through the okay. trees up to the, the, okay. the house to, the, to the, the south, I guess. We can figure that out. Okay. Uh, and then, then you mentioned this uh, in your presentation, you, you provided a snow plan. I always am happy when people think about what to do with snow. Um, what, but what I saw is that you're going to push it up around the tree. It looks like you're going to push, push a lot of it up around the trees. And I'm not the expert, so I think, Ms. Loeffler, you probably are the expert. If you have uh, chemicals, salt, um, ice melts, other kinds of things, is that going to, um, is, is pushing the, the snow up around the trees the appropriate place to put it, or will that lead to damage of, the, of those trees and plants? And should we find another place to put that? Some trees have uh, different salt tolerance than others. Um, I think what we were thinking is that the um, the grass paved area probably wouldn't be actually used for parking, and that might be a place that we would be putting the majority of the snow. Um, and then there were some other areas on the periphery for that. Um, I think we can probably provide more detail. Laura and I should talk about what what chemicals, if any, are being used for for de icing. Um, and come back to you with a dis full description of that. That would be great. Thank you. Um, is there any story? I noticed the units. This is probably a question for Mr. Chalmers, but the units have very little storage. I mean, they're only 265 square feet, and many people. Who are likely to be tenants, especially those with less than 30% of area median income, are unlikely to have a lot of stuff. But is there any storage for tenant goods beyond that little closet? So, is there storage in the basement? Is there storage in the attic, or things that are um, that they may want to seasonally store, or not? And, or, and how much storage is there in that closet? Is that nine by six, or or uh, you know nine by four? I mean, something like that. Yeah, there, there is limited storage. There, there's yeah. no access. There's no storage in the attic. That is not okay. an accessible spot. There's no way to get there. Um, there's and probably about, um, well, it varies per unit. Some have a little more storage, but, um, you know, it's probably about three, three feet, three linear feet by full ceiling height of storage in the, that might not be straight kitchen related in each unit. Um, Plus the closets. So oh, plus we don't closets. have we don't have storage. We don't have area in the basement for storage. So storage storage is a closet. It's cupboards in the kitchen, and often we'll do some kind of cabinet or little linen closet associated with the bathroom. Um, but we don't allow tenants to put stored uh, items in common areas, based on our experience that it. Yeah. That it it's, it piles up and it gets abandoned. Yeah. You have to be you have to be thrifty, um, and then of course we have bike storage outside, and that's the only kind of outside storage um, that we have. Is there room for a um, for a, a dresser or of some in the there is yeah. so yeah, we so have. We have so you can see furniture layouts that Tom has provided. He actually used what size beds? Full size beds, Tom. 
Uh, double, I think. Double beds. So if you went with a twin bed, it gives you a little more flexibility. I've seen people actually do loft beds uh, in some of these units. So they're sleeping up above and they might have a desk or a dresser below. People get pretty creative with it. And where is, what, what's the um, sheet for that? Is it here? So the in detail. Our, in, our bed, in our detail? So there's a couple of unit details. Actually, they're full, I think most of them are full, actually, with the, the excess. If you look at, um, in our presentation, it's A8.10. But we don't have that in our, in our, oh, okay. your submission. Sorry. So, um, but, or you can bring it up, if you can bring it up and share the screen, that would be helpful. I, I so you, you have it in your packet, it's A8.10 and A8.20. They're kind of blow ups of I different. Also, I think I, do you see that? Yep, I see that. That's helpful. Yeah, okay, so um, so that closet. These are hard numbers to read. That on one dash oh one. That closet up above is how many feet wide? Is that six feet wide? Yeah, it's a little yep. over six feet wide. Okay. Um, and then you some of them. So some of the smaller units have. Uh, a closet that's really part of the kitchen cabinet area. If you look at the mm -hmm. bottom, 105. But most of them have a have. It varies. It's sometimes it's built in as almost kitchen cabinet type closets, and sometimes it's actually frame closet. All right. So I can see the challenge that you're you're going to have trying to uh, keep people from storing a lot of things. You you. You try to minimize the amount of stuff that they're going to be bringing in, and that could be a challenge. But that's something you've taken yeah. on. Yeah, Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, uh, on that, um, I have a question. I guess first of all, the question is dealing with the use of the use. The use of this is housing for people of different uh, income strata. Um, of the 28 units, you have five that have a closet. The rest of them all have kitchen cabinets and maybe a vanity in the bathroom, but there's nowhere to hang anything. Um, what, what is your expectation for the people who move in there? Is this just a way station? And how long would they be staying there? So I'm looking at unit 105, which has a double closet next to the refrigerator. That would be a full closet. That's not so, a closet. Those are cabinets. Yeah, it would be a but it, it, but it would be a cabinet closet. I mean, it's basically to say. So uh, you, so you can hang coats and things in. Yeah, there. It, it'll be fitted out for hanging. So it'll be it, it'll be basically a closet, but built out of cabinet material. And it will have a closet pole in it and a shelf. So what then for the kitchen, what cabinetry is, the, is there for the kitchen? There's uh, base cabinets, there's overhead cabinets. So there'll be a sink base and this, there can be a cabinet, so the same unit to the right of the stove. Usually there's a little cabinet over the fridge. It's not a ton of cabinets, but for a single person, you know, it's a basic usable kitchen space um, with a full refrigerator, a sink, a microwave, a cooktop, and an oven. Um, it, we do not at all see it as a way station. We've owned properties similar to this with smaller uh, apartments for 30 years. We've had tenants stay for 20 years in those tiny units. So for some people, this is a great place to live. Um, and it, in cities, we're seeing a lot of micro units like this that are, again, smaller than this, that are super popular because housing has become so expensive. Um, so no, I would see some people are coming here because, and it's a stepping stone in a, in a housing ladder, and they're starting kind of out of a shelter into this. 
um, and then maybe they move on to a one bedroom apartment if they have a good job. Um, for other people, they're living on a limited fixed income and this is a great option for them because they don't have to share a kitchen and bathroom with someone. And a lot of adults don't want to be living in shared situations like they did when they were students. Okay, let me ask you then in terms of the income, you say that uh, uh, the lowest uh, rent is uh, basically 30 at 30% 30 of income, which uh, at the top is 17,950. And that that rental then is 737 a month. For the 50%, which comes out to 299 at the top, the rent is 740, it's three dollars more. Yeah. Why is there such a, why is it so close? Why is the 30% um, even close to the 50%? Sure, the, it's the last column. So the 30% units have an, a, what's called a project-based subsidy attached to the unit. So those folks who are very low income are not gonna pay 737. They're gonna pay a third of their income for rent. So it could be $200. The balance to come up to 737 is gonna be paid by the subsidy. The folks in the 50% and 80% units have a fixed rent. They have to come up with that much. They have to have enough income to be able to afford these units. Um, by the way, all of the utilities are included in these rent levels. So it's heat, hot water, electricity, um, central air conditioning, et cetera. So some people choose this because there aren't other options anywhere near this price range in Amherst or Northampton. And if you only have so much money, you might want a bigger place, but this is what you can afford. And we have a lot of people in that situation. Okay, thank you. So what, is the, what do the initials MRVP stand for? The Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program. So it is the state equivalent of what's called the Section 8, Section which is eight. the federal. Okay. Yeah, this yep. is the I'm state, Section eight. state version of that. Yep, I understand. Okay, that's what it is. I just was unfamiliar with the... Uh, Part of the reason the we're, see we're seeking those is the state will provide a little bit of supportive services um, money for these previous, the, the homeless preference units. And that helps us pay for the resident services coordinator position. It's not the whole thing, but it helps. So in the case of somebody who is at 30%, the, the, the max of 30% of yeah. uh, area income, with an income of almost $18,000, they right. will pay 479, yeah. About two hundred and fifty dollars will be. Get, you'll get two hundred and fifty dollars from the MRVP. Okay. Bring Correct. you up to your seven thirty-seven, which is your economic rent that you need, right? Right. Okay. Exactly. And you don't have any subsidies for the. Well, couldn't there be a section eight for a, a fifty or an eighty percent of of median income? Or are there um, are any of those available anymore? Yeah, they are, and so in theory there could be. We are responding to comments that we had from, especially from neighbors, and also the housing trust, that they really wanted to see a mixed income property. Sure. Sure. They didn't want a property where everybody was desperately low income. So, and we agree that it's a healthier social environment to have a mix. And mm -hmm. so to have people who have jobs and, and need, have enough money to pay these rents, we see as, you know, a good thing for the overall social health of the building. And one last question. Help me with 40 hours per week, Massachusetts minimum wage, 50 weeks, 50, probably 52 weeks a year. Yeah. Um, what does that give you for an annual income again? <laughs> it's in here. It was just under 25,000, I think. So just under, so that they would be in the 50%. They would be within the 50%. So you could have, you could have people working minimum wage jobs, yeah. 40, 40 hours a week, and yeah. they, could, they may not be subsidized. Right. They may not right. be subsidized at that. So they could right. be paying $740 right. a month for, right. he or she could pay $740 a month for their housing. 
Right. And utilities. So utilities. there is, a, in, a, in essence, there's a subsidy because the capital to build the project is subsidized. And the trade is we give the town and the state a guarantee that will hold the rents to these lower levels. So $740 for a studio apartment with all utilities in a nice location in Amherst is below market. So when we did a market study in Northampton for this same kind of unit, the market comparable, I think it was around $930, believe it or not, for the value of this unit. So even though there's no subsidy in the unit itself, someone is paying below market rent. And that's the whole point. Yep. Um, one, one other question I have is um, in terms of supportive services, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, in, in subsequent um, hearings, but what is the plan? What struck me is that you have people there during daylight hours and maybe during the week, um, but they're not there 24, there's nobody there 24 hours. Right. And so what is, and you don't have, and you have a management office where they can call to your management team and that normally they deal with you know a broken water pipe but what sure. if you what if there is a mental health crisis during right. the middle of the night what if right. there is something other than what you know calling the police or calling someplace just calling some service themselves what do you provide or what do you anticipate would be the role of your company or the or your staff yeah. to help out in that situation yeah well, I, part of the role I see for the resident services coordinator is to make sure that people know where to get emergency resources. So for example, um, CSO has an emergency 24 hour mental health crisis line. And that's the local provider in our area. So what I picture in the common room is having a resource directory that will help people navigate when they need that emergency resource and it's after hours. What we find is that people don't come to crisis just all of a sudden, it's a progression. And so the value of having a resident services coordinator is what we're trying to do is preventative so that we see that someone is decompensating, we see that they're not leaving their room, we see these things and we can get some assistance to them before they have a crisis. And it won't always happen that way, but it, it's much better to um, have someone who can observe because it's usually a long time coming, honestly. People don't just suddenly break. Um, those, are, those are my questions um, that I have at this time. I don't know if there's, if any of, can we eliminate the share screen so I can see the, uh, get a gallery view? Oh yeah, sorry. That's okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, what I want to do is see if any of our, yes, any of my board members have a question. Mr. Maxfield? I got um, <clears throat> a couple of questions here with this. Um, so for the, the homeless preference there, you said it's going to be, it's a, they pay a third of their income is what they pay in rent of whatever yeah. that is. Um, and if their income is zero, do they, they pay zero? I think actually now the minimum rent is $50. But if someone has no income, usually they're eligible for at least SSI and it's just really a matter of getting them some income. So there are a lot of people who are living just on SSI, which is a, could be, you know, seven to $800, $900 a month. And yeah. so that's it. They can't, they can't afford housing in our area. So if that is something like that were the case where they were saying getting, I'm sorry, you said something like SSI, they're getting 800 a month. Does that then mean that they would then be turning around and paying uh, $260 a month in rent? Correct. Got it. And then um, what typically, how often would you say you folks deal with um, evictions of tenants and, uh, What's the type of thing that usually triggers eviction for you folks? Sure. I think like most landlords, um, non-payment of rent can be an issue um, anywhere you look. Um, I would say both our, our property management and other staff work really hard to try to not evict people. Um, but certainly if someone's breaking the lease, if they're 
making persistent noise or doing something that bothers their neighbors, um, they will eventually get evicted. Okay, is it, is it safe to say that um, typically it's, it's not financial reasons that people are being evicted from low income housing in your, in your projects, is that uh, correct? Sometimes it's a mix of both. I would say generally that's true, although if people aren't compliant with various program rules, they can lose their benefits. And so then it becomes financial, but it, it started with some kind of behavioral issue that then translates into a financial issue. I mean, if you don't send in your paperwork, you don't show up for you know your annual inspection for your voucher, you're not gonna have a voucher pretty soon. So sometimes they're kind of wedded together. Um, so we, we go the extra mile with tenants because we're all about people having housing. Um, but there's no perfect housing for, for all people. I mean, there's no perfect system. And people do have difficult times, even within a supported structure. And um, that policy of one third of, uh, of income, is that based on, on some type of voucher program, how that works, or that's uh, your, your policy? Is that a state or local policy, or is that your policy? Yeah. It's not our policy. It would be the policy of who, whoever's providing the voucher. So the mass rental voucher program would set their standard. It tends to be about a third of income. Sometimes you can exclude some medical bills or, you know, they have a whole uh, verification system that they do with tenants to determine what their contract rent will be. But I can tell you in general, it's going to be between 30 or 35% of their income. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's all my questions for right now. So one thing I would add, Mr. Maxfield, is that that 30% has been a number used to, 30% um, of income has been that number used to determine rent for people on subsidized housing for years in the federal programs going back. And so it's, it's been adopted as kind of a benchmark for, you know, for decades as the appropriate amount that people should pay for, uh, for subsidized housing. Right, so when I showed the slide choices. about 42% yeah. of Amherst renters paying more than 50% of their income for rent, that's where we're at. It's, it's not 30% and it's not even 50%, it's more than 50% just to afford housing. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions that people have? Well, I noticed that in, there were several questions that we, there were lots of questions that we had, and I think we're all taking notes on requests for additional information um, and requests for, you know, further work on your part, whether it's the, the photometric plan or a better, a, a more complete um, uh, landscape feeling for what, what, the, what it's going to look like um, yeah. once the trees are removed, some ideas about the, um, the height of the trees at when those trees are planted, what it would be look, looking like at maturity, you know, 15 years from on or whatever maturity would be in, in an architect's world. I don't know what that is, but um, we look for that. And, and some of this, I'd like, I'd like to have as much of this as possible for our next meeting, um, as well as some kind of a parking management plan for the next, for our next meeting. Um, whether you have, are you going to use um, stickers are do you have how are you going to how are you going to make sure that the parking the cars that are parked there to the extent there are cars parked there belong to the to the um, right. tenants yep. so I'd like to I'd like to have as much of this available by by the second July 2nd I know that's quick but yeah. we're trying to but uh, you can do some of it by then sure. and I, I, I would sure. like to have a lot of it as much as you possibly can we're trying to move this as quickly as possible we and I also don't that. want to have a lot of time between this meeting and when the and when there's going to be the majority of the public comments. So I don't want it to go stale. I right. really do want to have this be fresh in in everybody's minds uh, when they talk. So um, let's let's look at the. If it's okay with you, I'd like to look at the second uh, for yep. presentation of a lot of this stuff. And yep. we'll work. And please work with the staff with Maureen, especially. There may be other things that we just didn't identify tonight that we. Um, we didn't specifically identify, but which we talked about and should be part of a subsequent more fulsome um, presentation or, or documents from on your part. Okay. 
Yes, would it be helpful for the board? We have a property that's similar that's just finishing construction now in Northampton. And I could provide photos of some of those units, including the kitchen area. It might help you visualize what what's in the kitchen, what it would look like, things like that. You, you've read my mind. I was, you know, you read my mind. I, I, one of the things I was going to ask about is if you've managed similar properties with the similar income groups, and if there was any way you could show us some of the some pictures from some of that. So yep. that would be very, very helpful. And also yes. your your kind of your history with very low income, very yep. low income people and, and how you've managed that property. I, I think we'd like to hear more about that um, in yep. subsequent meetings. Okay. All right. Um, we've got, we're almost at nine o'clock. Um, I don't think it, in my determination, it doesn't make sense to begin the, prob the public comment with just eight minutes where we just get one comment. So um, I think we'll hold off public comments until next week. Uh, when we are, when we have the, the next meeting. Um, let's see, what else do we have to do? That's it. So uh, what I'd like to do is move that we uh, continue this public hearing on this matter to 6.30, not 6, but 6.30 next Thursday, July 2nd. Um, and we continue the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second. second. <laughs> Is there any discussion on the motion to continue this matter, this public hearing, till Thursday, July 2nd? No. Nope. All right. All in favor? Oh, it's got to be a roll call. I'm sorry. I, I got to get used to this. It's always a roll call with Zoom. So I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Aye. Motion passes five to nothing. Um, so the last item on the agenda, uh, on the agenda for this meeting is the opportunity for public comment on any matter that is not the subject of this public hearing. So anything before the ZBA that's not a subject of, of this public hearing. And we, we always make that uh, this public comment available at our meetings. So um, Maureen, could you help me see if there's anybody in the attendees that wish to speak on something that's not about this particular application? Yes, yeah, so if anyone from the public has any comments about items that are, as, as the chairman said, uh, items that have not been discussed tonight, you would have to click on the button to raise your hand to indicate that you have something to say. I am not seeing any hands being raised. I'm not raised. seeing any hands. Okay, so the, I, the, with our meeting next on July 2nd, um, I anticipate that there will mostly be public comment. We will take we will update the board members with the material that you provide, um, that the applicant provides to us. Make sure that we all have that. And we may be some, a short discussion about that, but the July 2nd meeting will be principally public comment and um, we will meet at that point. So with that, um, unless there's any further discussion, I move that we had, we've continued the, the hearing. So I move that we adjourn this meeting um, for tonight and that we meet again in um, next Thursday. Do I have a second? All right. All, um, I agree. I, I vote aye. <laughs> I really want to do these voice votes. It's so hard. <laughs> Mr. Langsdale, how do you vote? Aye. <laughs> Ms. O'Meara, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Parks, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Maxfield, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Uh, the motion passes five to nothing. We're done. Thank you, everybody, for all your work. Thank you to the applicants for your presentation. Thank you. For your thank time. you to the public for for, for uh, great questions. Thank you. Participating. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Talk to you next week. <laughs>